Okay, good evening and welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, February 2nd, 2016. We'll start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Board started off this evening in executive session where we discussed strategies with respect to collective bargaining for the police and fire department and also conducted strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel relative to the town manager. I am pleased to report that as part of executive session, the board unanimously voted to uh, approve and execute a new contract with the town manager, um, carrying us through until 2019. Um, however, we also need to vote that in public session. So, Chair, before I leave, Brian. Shall I entertain a motion to uh, approve the contract with the town manager? Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous, so we vote that in public session as well now. Um, we'll move into public session here with the public forum. Residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Do we have anyone who'd like to speak? Good evening. Hi. Cindy Chessmore. I'm the director of the Senior Center. Norman invited us to just speak a minute or two about a program we have that's, which should be a great interest to the town. Uh, we were very fortunate to get a grant from uh, Mass Council on Aging for a networking group and a job fair. Uh, Amy Beck is our assistant director. She'll be running it, and she'll just tell you a little bit about it. Hi. Uh, what we have, like Cindy said, is we're going to be having a uh, networking group that will be meeting twice a month, primarily aimed at the 50 and older, older crowd. Um, it'll be meeting on the second and fourth Thursdays of every month. We have a group facilitator, Don Quesnell, who is a career coach recruiter who will be working with um, people who will be coming to the group. And then we'll be working with a workforce career center in Milford who will be, they will be putting together the job fair for us at the senior center. We're expecting that to happen in June. The job fair, I mean the networking group, excuse me, is like I said, the second and fourth Thursdays of every month. They starting on next Thursday on the 11th of February. Uh, let's see. Are there any other questions about it? It's really primarily to help those who are wanting a career change, who are looking for work, or even seniors who have retired but are not ready to stop working. Cindy, this is the uh, email you sent the other day, correct, to make the announcement? Great. Thank you for coming and making the announcement. Oh, uh, very good. We hope that people, you know, make use of it, and especially where it's for those 50 and older because there's still the stigma out there that our center is only for those 60 or 65, which isn't true. We want more people coming in, and Great. we can be of help, and that's what we're there for. Well, thank you for coming tonight and making the announcement yourself. All set. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming in. Anybody else for public forum? Seeing no takers, uh, we are running a little bit late tonight, and so uh, and we got a full house for, I suspect, one topic in particular, so I'm going to skip right ahead to it, which is item five on the agenda. You raise your hands if you're not here for beavers. Okay. So, uh, which is beaver activity in Whitehall Brook. This is an action item. The residents of Huckleberry Road will present a remediation proposal developed by the beaver specialist, Malcolm Spiker. I want that on my business cards. To address beaver issues in the neighborhood. Residents also submitted an application for an emergency beaver permit submitted to the Board of Health, received by the Board of, from the Board of Health. The Pratt Farm Master Plan team is requesting that the Board of Selectmen engage in, in a beaver dam abatement within Whitehall Brook in conjunction with the residents of Huckleberry Road so that the Pratt Farm Master Plan team can be in the work charged to them and accurately locate the wetland boundaries and buffer zones. And there's a bunch of attachments here. Um, just to set the stage for this, so um, there's actually been a lot of folks out looking at this. I actually went and walked on this stream this weekend to kind of see what was going on. So, and then also today, we had the town manager and several of the town staff go out there as well and do the same thing all over again. So we've had a lot of folks out there looking for the activity, and we have um, a couple people in the room tonight who can, are on the town side to answer some of the major questions. Um, uh, can I get, is, do you all have a, a are you going to speak? Okay, sure. Why don't you come on up and, again, I, you know, I don't think we get it, right? Flooding's an issue, you know, you're, you've sort of talked about before. Maybe you just want to sort of briefly summarize what you're looking for and, and why you think the town um, can help or should help? Absolutely. So my name is Robert Scanavan. I reside at 26 Huckleberry Road. I'm speaking on behalf of all the residents of Huckleberry Road, many of whom are here tonight. Uh, what we're looking for here tonight is really a commitment from the town to participate financially in the beaver remediation on Whitehall Brook. 
Uh, we feel this is an appropriate action of the town, and there is precedent um, in the town's history where, um, as a butters to all of the pro our properties, um, through both the Pratt Farm property and 66B Fruit Street, or the Fruit Street complex, the town is a, are abutters on a significant portion of the brook, and we feel it would be appropriate for the town to participate in this remediation. In the past, the town has um, actively um, remediated beaver activity when it has threatened public property, such as flooding on public roads. Um, and we feel this is a similar situation where the beaver flooding is affecting the Pratt Farm property, limiting the development there. Um, so for all these reasons, we feel it would be appropriate for the town to uh, financially participate in this remediation effort. Okay. Good. Um, so why don't we just dive right into it, Mr. Kamalo. Uh, so the key questions here at hand are, um, what's the status of the brook? Um, are, is the town's property being impaired? And then also, um, uh, I, and also the questions of, are the very the sort of fairly factual questions I ask you to answer about what, how the town gets involved because it's actually not, we have to make sure we do this the right way um, uh, uh, and, and sort of and have a legal basis for, for incurring expense. So can we start off, and Ed, do you want to? Uh, do you want to try and just bring up some of the town's jazz? Yeah, you want to show the, why don't you show the map and talk about where the water is, where the water should be, and, and why it's where it is. And I think the focus probably, I mean, we can talk about the public health implications and the fact that these folks have wells they're concerned about, but we should certainly start off yeah, at least with, the, with where it impacts the town's property, please. I just want to make one comment. Uh, we do have our expert, uh, Mr. Malcolm Spiker, here. Okay. So if there are any questions about the remediation plan, he'd be happy to address them. Right. So we'll get to remediation once we get the, I want to get the facts on the ground first about what, what's where and, and compared to what should be where. Um, and then I also want to talk about, again, how the town has an opportunity to get involved. Go ahead. I think uh, just to give you a, a, an overview of the area, you, you're looking at um, the Whitehall Brook, which basically flows um, this, this way. So basically, you've got the, uh, the culvert right here at Fruit Street. And as the back's through here, you can see the Pratt Pond land right here that the town recently purchased. This is the, the pond you can, that you can see from Fruit Street and Whitehall Brook basically goes right along through here. And as it gets back up here, there, these are the athletic fields at 66 Fruit Street, right through here. So um, I think what you're looking at now from beaver activity is probably pretty well shown by the GIS's MassDAP's Mass DAP's wetland data. So you probably have standing water throughout these areas where the, the brook is still underneath. Uh, when Ed and myself walked uh, earlier today, we did see a little water coming out here, a little on the back end of the, uh, the field back here, and a little in this area right here. I have some site photos if you guys wanted to see it. And then we walked along the back of the, the fruit tree. You've got a lot of uh, burns and uh, uh, grades here that don't allow um, the water to go pretty much uh, beyond this area. And for the, well, we were a month ago on the residents, we did see wetlands, uh, water levels out behind here. And what might be showing a little better, what they might be experiencing, we just look at the 2010 100 year floodplain. Obviously, there is no, none of this area of Pratt Farm is flooded. These folks might be experiencing some of it as, as high as this or in between, maybe down there. Obviously, these houses here aren't underwater, but they may have more um, water between the blue and the, and the pink. And obviously, that house isn't underwater. So, on the Huckleberry side, they may be experiencing some of the pink, whereas the town is hardly experiencing any of the pink on the uh, house end. Hmm. Town's pretty much experiencing that. So, well, why don't we just go to board members for questions? Um, Todd, you want to start off? Um, well, I guess eventually I would like to. I'd like to hear about the remediation plan. I'd also like to get an idea of, um, I guess, thoughts, expectations. I, I hear. I hear the term that you'd like for the town to participate 
I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means about the kind of paper. Okay. But do you have any questions on the facts about the about no, the water, no, no. where the water is? like the blue check is what everybody would expect it to be under normal circumstances. And then, you know, a little bit of the pink here and there that was up uh, is, is what's there now. I'm not questioning about all people's concerns as far as the property. Okay. Mr. Catino? Yeah, can you define wetlands for me? Because wetlands can be, you know, I grew up, uh, grew up on, on the ocean and, and it could go. So. Yeah, I grew up in the ocean, and it could be uh, just uh, you know, marshland. It could be uh, you know, three inches of water, two inches of water, two feet of water. And so, what, what does what is that that uh, checked area showing us? Basically, if you can see that little line right through there. Mm -hmm. That would be the the bank of the stream. So the perennial stream is contained within that bank, and then next to the bank would be wetlands, as, you, as you're saying, would be bordering the bank of the stream. So what this is showing is, you, you'll see the whole river just get totally obscured and see how much wider it gets. That's trying to indicate the bordering vegetated wetlands next to the perennial streams. So typically, you wouldn't, ex you wouldn't expect that, that entire area to be totally inundated with water. You would expect the water to be within the banks of the perennial stream. Um, I think the beaver activity out there is exacerbated and it's brought it back out to the edge of BVW. BVW is really, a lot of it's confined by the... By the what, what's BVW? Border of Vegetated Wetlands. Okay. So it's the wetlands next to the next to Whitehall Road, basically. And then, if you get a, a flooding event, then what you can anticipate would be standing water up to those areas. But then, you know, obviously after the, you know, then you would expect it to recede. So you, you wouldn't really expect the, that blue area to always be in the water. We would expect the water to be contained within the, the bounds of the banks of the pond. But when I, when I went and walked it, uh, and, and uh, Jim and I just talked about walking on the ice, I was there before it was frozen, and there really was deep standing water going up, uh, you know, even beyond some of that, some yeah. of that blue. So, yeah, you do have inundation of the of the wetlands. A lot of the a lot of the wetlands, there are wetlands you can walk across and your feet stay dry. Right. Exactly. So um, I would think a lot of the, the blue area wouldn't have sand water because because of the amount of beaver activity that has historically been out there. I was out I was out on twenty Huckleberry Road mm -hmm. in, back in two thousand and nine and the water was just as high as when I was out there in, in two thousand and fifteen. So it's been a historic area of beaver activity. If I could just make one comment to no, that. No, actually, you know what, see, I want to go, can I, can I just, I want to get the board questions and I'll come back to you, I promise. But I just, I, I just what I want to let folks ask their questions to start. A um, couple of things, so just for, so everybody understands it's here tonight. So tonight I'm here as a selectman. The other night when we were gathering, I was there as a member of the Pratt Farm team, right? So tonight I have to do a little bit of a different job. Um, so bear with me a little bit as we work through this. Who owns the stream? Do we own the stream? Not a survey, but I, I, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the the parcel lines that are on the uh, on the town's map, if I can just go down maybe off. My sense is That's a much better map. This is Pratt Farm. This is Fruit Street. I would assume the town owns half, and the other people own the other half. Okay. Or it goes right up to the edge. And back to the pink map, if you could, please. To the aerial? To the flood plain map. Certainly. So is anybody here in the audience that has water in that pink area? And is it as is it as close to the house as it appears to look on this map? Is it's twenty feet from your house, and how deep is your lot? Uh, it goes all the way back to the, to the rock. Two hundred feet, a hundred feet, fifty feet. It's so it's, so it's way up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To the edge of our grass and the edge of the yeah. trees. There was a bunch of houses with with water right to the. They're, they're kind of burned up. They're kind of lifted up, so they're not, you know, they're, they're 
five feet above the water, but but the water was at the edge of the grass for several houses. Spot between 20 and 18 where it's coming over. See, I don't know the numbers. I just I was on I, did, I was on the stream side, you know, the Pratt Farm side. So, I, but I mean, there's places certainly where it's right there. And, and so then, when we were doing our due diligence to purchase the land, how did this did this come up? Did this issue come up? Yes, it did. And how was it addressed? I think it was pointed out to, to the town that uh, part of the parcel uh, fell under the floodplain zone. With a flood ongoing? No, not, not, not. I would not characterize it as a flood on the town side. Well, I'm just trying to figure out you know, what we did to sort of understand what we were buying. You know? Well, we have those maps. But when we purchased the land, we had to delineate, we had to do a survey, right? And we had to delineate wetlands and all that as part of that due diligence, didn't we? It's on the just, it's on the just, yeah. Okay. So based on all that, I'm not sure how we avoid not engaging in this process of remediation. I think the core questions are, uh, we, I think, the most straightforward path is for us to decide that this is affecting the towns. I don't know, and Mr. Kamai asked to get the answer to this question. I'm sure he has it. Uh, when I talked to him earlier, I, I don't know the pathway for us to pay for remediation of individual property owners' problems, right? It, so I think the most direct pathway is for us to decide that this is impacting the town's property as well, in which case it becomes a fairly simple process, right? So I think that that's why the, the facts of where the water is matter a lot because mm. if we believe it's impacting the town's property, then it's fairly clear that we'd want to take some action on it, right? Then it, you know, they're obviously feeling impacted. The problem is if it's not, I think it's a much harder... Did, did you get any guidance from Mr., you know, the town council on this about... about um... Yes, he, he did offer a preliminary response. Okay. Um, in which... He identified protecting public health or safety. Mm -hmm. So the wells. This includes town okay. infrastructure. But that's the town's property. How about exactly. the, their, their property would be because they have wells? Would that be the argument? Is that sufficient, that they have a well? Do you all, do you all have wells? So, if, I mean, if protecting their water supply is probably a good, a good reason. Yeah, because there's... I'm sorry, Norman. Yeah, we still have to pursue that aspect of the question with town council. Okay. But anyway, the most straightforward path has always been if it's impacting the town and we decide we want to remediate it, then it's kind of simple. The complicating factor is it's, it's, it's not been made completely clear, maybe we want to explore this further, that it's really meaningfully impacting the town's property. Gotcha. So I'm asking the questions just to get a better feel for the sort of liability and responsibility and everything else. Um, Okay. Has anyone's home been damaged in a way that they can't repair, or is this just a lawn inconvenience thing at this point? Or do we have do we have assets um, that you feel that you think are challenged as a result of this? I mean, I guess I would answer that by saying this, to us, this isn't really a property issue. This is a a safety issue where we're worried about our wells becoming inundated. So in terms of damage to the properties, I mean, it's, I think that'd be challenging to say. We've all lost portions of our backyards. You know, my, what, you, it used to be a 10-foot brook. is now a 40- or 50-foot quagmire. You know, and that's, that's land that, you know, we're not, you, we're not able to use. Mm. But no well damage to date that you're aware of? So we've st many of the residents have started having their wells tested. Um, thankfully, so far, I'm not aware of anybody having increased coliform bacterial counts. Um, but our expert does tell us that it's not a question of if, it's just a, a matter of when, based on the degree of flooding. And the beaver infestation, the contamination of beaver fecal matter, and the proximity to our wells. Okay. And this is not a court proceeding, so bear with me a little bit. But having established that, you know, we don't have any damage to date, and if we address what we need to address on our land, that will take care of that problem as well. Uh, I think there should be a path forward here somehow. Okay. Anyone, John? Just listening, learning. Listening, learning, nothing, no questions? Okay. 
I just ask, is, is there any seasonality to, uh, to how far the water's down there? On the town's land, I haven't seen a difference in the last two months. I was out on uh, December 3rd and I was out today. So the amount of water on the, on the town's land is the same. Do we expect, do we expect in the spring for it to get a little higher with, you know, if we ever get snow, snow melt, um, and then in the summer for it to go down? When I met with the, uh, the residents on uh, December 8th, December 3rd, I <coughs> observed uh, uh, one of the uh, dams on the, uh, that abutted the, uh, the one between the Pratt, the Pratt Farm uh, portion of the land. And the water was right up to the edge of the beaver dam. And uh, we anticipated if, if we had some snow melt or rain, we'd assume water would cascade over the dam. That's what happened today. When Ed and I were out there, there was water pouring over that dam. And uh, the lower dam as well wasn't all the water. And water was proceeding all the way and going through the fruit tree culverts that just recently got replaced. I was out there in October, took pictures right before we were replacing them. The water going through in October looks the exact same as what's going through today. But I would say that we have experience. So after we have, we, uh, we walked uh, the, the, the area with our expert on December 8th. We took photos at that time, particularly we have some very clear benchmarks of some test wells or other wellheads that are in the area. Um, when we walked that after the significant rainfall we had the following weekend, those wells had, those wellheads were underwater. So the water level in that area had risen three or four inches to cover the wellheads. Okay. Can you talk about what's there in terms of dams and beaver dams and all now? I, you know, again, I saw two things this weekend, and I guess you saw a third. Yeah, but, uh, I know Malcolm is getting into the, the when me and Ed walked the, uh, we found two dams here and here. And we found a lot of dams here as well. We walked the perimeter. We were so far, we were facing the edge of the water, looking in. We couldn't see any of the dams. And when we walked the, the property on December 8th with the, with the residents, we only walked from here to here. We did not walk, we weren't invited to uh, the properties back here, so we're only looking at, we only looked at about that area right there. So who knows the status of the dams and what's there? Your, so your, expert, your guy? Uh, okay. Can you come forward and, go ahead, I'm sorry. We do have, he did provide us with a map as an overlay of the town. Okay. A couple extras if you would like. Yeah, thank you. That'd be wonderful. Can, can you just on. talk about, so I went out through this, again, I went out there, not to keep saying that, and I, and I saw sort of two things. One that looks like a culvert that's got a cut in it. I, I only walked on the Pratt farmland, and I saw one thing that looks like a culvert that has a cut in it, and I saw one thing that looks like a, a, a path that has a cut in it. Are there really that many dams out there? Of this there are. Can you even to zoom in? Okay. I'm going to just right that here. map on it. Just stay right however, here. Yep, however you want it. Okay. I'll introduce myself. I'm Malcolm Spiker. My company is known as Beaver Specialist. I'm out of Spencer, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, I did a site visit over here about a week ago, Monday. And this gentleman that said he was walking on the ice, how many times did you fall through? None. I, but it was close. It was a close run thing. I was almost a fire rescue. Three. Did you? Okay. That's the difference of the water warming up, the water flowing, and those different kinds of things. The last time I was over my head, so I decided it was time to get off. Okay? So that's in the lighter side. Um, when I started out, I started, parked at between the pond and Whitehall Brook. I went up through. Um, you'll notice on the map there, um, I didn't use a, a measure or anything. I just kind of went by the houses off of Fruit Street where I found active dams. Um, I didn't go very far up Fruit Street till I found one that's about six, seven feet high. And there's an active beaver house in that one. Um, if you go on up a little ways, you'll find another one. And then it kind of bends around and there's bulrushes. It opens up into a swampy area. Yeah. Right, right on the other side of that, part way through that swamp, you can see an old beaver dam. So that's an, a dam that's not active. There's a couple of old beaver huts in that swamp. But then after you get past that, you'll find uh, several more. Uh, as I went up around, um, I put X's for beaver, old beaver houses. The round dot is your active beaver houses, which have fresh mud and also a food cache that extends out into the water. That's their food supply while it's iced over so they can live. That's how beavers function. Just black? 
Just the black dots? The black are dots are active beaver houses. Or that does not... Blue dots that are here too. I have no idea. Those are dots. I got this map Potential from... vernal pools. That's what I figured, vernal pools. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't indicate any bank dens. There's one dam there that's kind of dumped out uh, a couple of feet, and there's a canoe down in the ice. Yeah, this there is like a stuff. yeah, it looks like a culvert or something. Like, yeah, yeah, not a culvert, well, but a thing. That's yeah. a gravel bank over there, and there's a beaver house right up around the, the bend there. So, with the but snow that, when I was there, I couldn't tell. I looked for bubble lines in in the ice. That will tell you where the beavers travel under the ice, where uh, aquatic life that moves on the ice uh, travels. And usually, if they have a bank den or something like that. But I figure. With that side beaver house that's in there, and that's one of the pools I fell into. Um, there is a humongous beaver house, a large food cache. So that kind of food cache tells me that there's probably some bank dens in the ground. So okay, so we'll trust you that the beavers are there. Can you just talk about the extent to which these dams are? I'm sorry, I'm just I, you know I, I, okay. I'm just trying to move this along. Can you just talk about the extent to which the dams are retaining the water? Like which one, are there one? Are there are they all problems or just some of them? Like yeah. at least two of them are are man-made yeah. to me, right? And that, that Well, just they were man-made and washed out, and the beavers came back and filled them over. Yeah, partially, yeah. right. Like, yeah. the one with that canoe in it is, is clearly... Um, as far as volume of water? Yeah, what's, hold, what's making this problem to, you know, for these folks? What's making the problem for these folks? The beaver dams. Now, I get that. Back in, is there back any, are they in, in totality, or is, there, is it just they all do a little bit? No, the, these aren't affect number three. No. Do they all do something, or is, um, or is a couple of these... If you come up around problem? three... There's one, two, three, and then you come over um, around 20 up in the back here. This is, this is very high back in here. Like to my eye, it's that dam with the canoe in it that's causing all the problems because that, yeah. that's, that's this is, this hugely is, holding the water up. Yeah, that. On your map uh, below uh, dam number three going yeah. towards Fruit Street, yeah. that's this that's, dam right that's here. That's that dam right there. That is um, allowing water to flow. That's from today. Yeah. Um, that's from um, that's a down river that's, shock. Uh, December third. Yeah. And let's get to the yep, back, sorry. back up. Yep. You can see, that's see the one that looks like so a big culprit. That's, that's, that's the beaver dam today. Up above. Yeah. Which is labeled number three yeah. on and it's about six feet higher. Yeah. Um, you might be able to uh, But if you come back down to that other one, here's yep. a, a an old beaver dam right there. There's an old beaver dam right there. That, that one out by the, the yeah, yeah, that's an old beaver dam coming well, across. Over in the back of that big stub, there's an old beaver dam. Sometimes you'll find adults problem? living like, in those kind of That's actually it right there. Like, what's the scale? scale? Well, that stub is, there's a beaver house over in there, too. Okay. Yeah. So are, are there any of these that are particularly troublesome? I have no idea. Oh, okay. the height of the water that's being hey, uh, can, can I just, uh, we can't go back and forth, right? The board's got to run this. this. So well, can, can we just talk about, are there, are there any of these that are specifically, okay. I, I'm trying to figure out, is there, is there a couple of these that are a huge issue, or is it they all, they all add up? Like the one with the canoe in it looked to me like the, the biggest problem, because there's a huge pond in back of that, and that's the part that backs up on all these folks' houses. Downstream of them, there was nothing, I, you know, I, no people in that marsh smart. part. As, as far as depth-wise, there's quite several of them in there that are over eight feet deep. Yeah, but uh, but I couldn't. But they're tell not you. blocking the water because it's like a pond there, right? It's the. Well, but if you. It's that one this, that's making the if pond. You look at this floodplain yeah. map, yeah. and look at the brook, and then look at your uh, GSI map. The brook has, like uh, Don said earlier, you have your wetland areas, but a lot of places it was confined within that brook. Yeah. And now it's not confined within that brook. Okay. I couldn't give you a volume. Yeah. There's no way. I guess, I guess what I'd like to hear is what the proposed solution is. I mean, from, from my all of, you know, 30 minutes of Googling, you know, fever remediation, you know, it seems like you got to approach things from a number of different ways. Uh, if you just remove the beavers, beavers upstream are going to appropriate, and new, new beavers are going to move in, and they're going to create dams. You can't tear the dam down all at once because that can create more damage further downstream. Um, you know, there's there's a bunch of stuff going on. So I guess what's, okay. what's the basic I, solution? I put into the proposal that I gave to the residents. Uh, it would be on your front page there, um, and actually up in the, uh, the last paragraph. After the beavers would be removed, I suggest that there would be some kind of a maintenance plan put in. Uh, Personally, I feel if you checked it in April and took a look at what you had at activity, 
and then go back in October and see what you have. Uh, it could very easily be trapped with a live trap. We're doing the same thing at Legacy Farms now. We had the same kind of a situation at Legacy Farms. Right. But um, we're not here for Legacy Farms. We're here for Hopper Bay Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, well I, I want to get back, get into what, what I think Ben was trying to get at. Are there one or two of these dams that we could look at to start mediating this problem quicker? There's no. Okay. There's, there's the seven that I outlined are the ones that I feel are doing the most damage as far as backing up the water. And they'll all have active beaver huts. One actually has two active beaver huts in it. But okay. my suggestion also you'll find in here is only to lower the beaver dams three feet. Because uh, when I went to uh, some other mapping that I used with Google, uh, I feel three feet of beaver dam removal will put your brook back in where it belongs and leave your wetland areas the way it was before the beavers moved in. That's, that's the way I can see it when I do the overlays and the uh, different, different plants. So if you took three feet out. Removal of uh, three feet on how many dams? Six, six feet wide, three feet deep on seven dams. Seven dams. The seven dams that I have listed there. And it's 1,500 per dam? No. That's we'll do that in one package deal if we do the beaver re removal with the use of a conibear trap and can get a Board of, board of Health removal permit. Um, I was also informed that the town would prefer that we use live traps. Uh, we're not too keen on the first time around using a live trap. Uh, I brought some fact sheets along. I'm going to leave them here tonight. But a live trap, it'll cost you about 60% more for us to do the work because the, the, effective, uh, the effectiveness of using a live trap and the clumsiness, awkwardness, and lugging it around. The other thing that I want to point out is everybody thinks a live trap is safer than a kill trap. Kill traps are all submerged underwater. Live traps have to be used in open water. The law states that they have to be placed on beaver dams, bogs, or stumps. Where do kids play at first? On a beaver dam. The other thing is a beaver sees his brother caught here. We have to move that trap to another position to get the beaver caught. Well, if we use a live trap. I use live traps this fall to trap for the town of Hopkins and DPW and the Water Department. And it took me just about 30 days to get it accomplished for them. So, I would like, I, I brought the traps along. I know you guys don't have that kind of time, but if anybody wants to see a demo with a live trap versus a conibear trap, I would gladly demo, demonstrate that tonight. No, we're not, no, no show and tell. I would like to give, I'd like to give you guys these fact sheets. Uh, on the live trap, read the second paragraph, you recommend wearing a football helmet or a hockey helmet when you use that trap. Use a 42 inch piece of two by four to remove the safety. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay, so here's the things I think the board should, should decide. Uh, first of all, what's the rationale for getting involved here, right? So it should either, we should talk about whether we think the town's property is being infringed upon or it's just a public health concern because of the wells. The Board of Public Health wanted us to pursue this and their rationale was, is Ed back there? Yeah, Ed is here. Anybody? Yeah. Can you just talk, can you just very, very briefly talk about the rationale of the Board of Health and why they want us to do something? Well, uh, under the uh, auspices of the Special Emergency Permit, mm -hmm. that's where the Board of Health uh, acts. Yep. You have the opportunity to use the uh, body gripping trap that Malcolm has mentioned, do a breach to a beaver dam or put in water flow devices. So setting aside the question of what to kill them with, or use, not to kill them with, capture them with, whatever it is, do you, was there any, is there any rationale behind why the, this needs to be done from the Board of Health? Is there, it, the well, the, the, uh, there is a threat to the individual residents' wells. Okay. So that, that was So it's a well threat is a key issue. Okay. So we should talk about the extent to which the Board has, thinks there's a rationale to get involved or not. And then I think the second question would be, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do we want to do it with the residents, right, in what collaborative sort of fashion. And the third would be, um, uh, to the extent we want to direct this, how do we want to do it. Um, so can I jump in real quick yeah, just yeah. from the, so now from the Pratt Farm team uh, perspective okay. uh, and us, 
the town um, that we represent owning the land, we want to do certain things on this newly acquired piece of land uh, for the benefit of the community. To begin that process and understand how and where we can access and use land, we have to delineate the wetlands. We can't necessarily delineate the wetlands today because they're going to be different tomorrow and the week after and the week after. So there's a challenge for us on the Pratt Committee uh, to begin our work until we solve this problem. We need to address this okay. from our perspective. From the committee's, the from committee's, the committee's recommendation is that we address this to maximize the use of the property. That is correct. That committee voted on that question or that point uh, unanimously. Okay. I think that berm that you're referring to is closer to the Fruit Street Fields yes. uh, area. Is, yeah, the grading here. Yeah, the grading here protects um, the fields. The it's further down. Yeah. Yeah. In there. The grading there. You can bring in the grading. Well, USGS three meter. And just to give you a okay. sense of how that looks. You know, I'm. I'm perfectly open to the whole argument of, of public health uh, from the water levels, keeping them clean, but I think we also need to know what this looks like long term. Uh, you know, so short term, you know, looking at ten, twelve thousand dollars, something like that, it sounds like if we use the if we use the, the safe traps, the live traps, um, which I don't even want to get into that argument right now. But, um, you know, what's it look longer term? Is this something where it's $10,000 every year? You know, is it something where it's, you know, the maintenance is $2,000 a year? What are we opening up ourselves to, you know, in other parts of town? Things like that. I just think we need to have an idea. Well, and this is why it's important because there are definitely other places in town where there's beaver issues. And so anything we do here is going to be used as a rationale for doing something elsewhere. So I, I think that's why the, the logic of why we do this is critical to set expectations about where the town can and cannot intervene. So, yeah, okay. all of a sudden, you know, somebody who has town water is going to start saying they're going to be looking for public health issues. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is, I don't know if I need, well, go ahead. What is it? I, I just Real quick. make one statement. Sure. We've worked with a lot of municipalities where they have actually uh, shared the cost with the property owners on these kind of things. Okay, I don't, I don't need that. I, okay, thank I you. I didn't want the town to feel that um, it's all your responsibility. Okay, and thank you. Next time you go for a walk out there, go out by the Christmas trees and see how much of your farm is gone. I did. I was all. No, I don't need it. I, I was out there. I was out there. Okay. I, I walked. I walked that entire loop actually on the ice and on the grass. Time you guys want to walk the property, I can tell you where the water usually is and where it gets dammed up and flooded out from the beavers. Yeah. It's like he says, where the Christmas trees are, when the beavers are there, where that old road was washed out, it'll flood right into the fields. Okay. And stuff. Thank you, Tom. Um, okay. So, uh, does anybody want to talk about? So it seems like we have a consensus that, that maybe the, the rationale for getting involved here would be to protect the town's property um, in this case, and uh, which and, is approximate concern. Well, and, and, and public health. Yeah, well, public health, again, becomes a much larger, you open up a much larger box of, of opportunities for, for True, but then that is, to but, but I still see it as that, you know, that's, that's what we are here for, though. You know, we, we, we might be nervous about setting precedents, however, we 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 here we here for our for our constituency. Okay, John, anything? Have we ever mitigated uh, help mitigate uh, flooding in other parts of town, Mr. Kamal? Um, I'll defer that question to John Westerling and Ed. Like Mr. Westerling, this with Ed, our Department of Public Beaver Control. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have used uh, I think we used Mr. Spiker um, off of Front Street where we had downstream dams 
They were backing up the water that were threatening. It was actually coming up very close to the, to the, the high point of Front Street, and it threatened our culverts there and our infrastructure, which is not the case that we see here. Okay, but so the rationale there was to protect the town's roadways? Correct. The infrastructure, okay. Um, okay, so again, you know, here's the, here's the things we need to figure out. What's the rationale for acting? And then um, how would we want to do it with, um, with the residents if we do decide to act? And to the extent people want to direct how we, what we do, um, uh, uh, sort of any further commentary on, on trapping processes. Does, any, does anyone want to propose any ideas, make a motion, do anything to move this along? I'm, I'm not concerned about the, the precedent because uh, we don't own all the land in town. When people own the land, private residents own the land, and there's something happening on their land, it impacts other people around them, they have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. In this case, we happen to own the land that is impacting others around us, and we have to deal with it. So I don't see the precedent's a problem. I mean, if we own the land elsewhere in town, there's a problem, we're going to have to deal with that too. I, mean, that's I think the concern was more on the, the well issue. Um, you, find, you find yourself getting involved in places where you don't own land, but there's beavers in the river and they threaten people's wells. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but in that case, those residents, wherever that might be, can still bring it to the attention of the landowner, whoever that is, and if they don't address it, then there's other recourses. So I would think that could get addressed somehow, some way. It may not be pleasant, but it is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Come back to you, John. Uh, Don, can you talk to... Just that question, I'm sorry. How long has this been an issue that's been, you know, at this level of concern? Well, uh, resident, the previous property owner at 20 brought it to my attention back in 2009. So, so I know they've been on there at least since then. Mr. Chair, a couple of quick questions. Uh, can I go to John first just because he, he... So, he, uh, yeah, it's, I remember a couple of years ago this... The beaver issue coming before us. What was what was the resolution? It was over legacy. Yeah, what was the, the resolution to that? Outed legacy, uh, and the resolution is uh, was was just described uh, by uh, legacy hired him to take care of beavers. Yeah. North Mill, South Mill, Cecilia Delgadi, uh, George uh, Connors, where they had a, a issue. We took care of it. That, uh, they had come to the town, but it's all privately owned over there. Okay. Good. Thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Kamala. And, and for, the, for the board's information, that process was funded by Mr. McDowell. Okay. Yeah. And, okay, Mr. Hart. Is there a neighborhood association in this area of town? No. No, okay. Um, and what is the total budget to address the, both the dams and the beavers that, ex that reside there today? What is the total amount of money we're talking about here? I, I looked at it quickly. I didn't fully if, compute if it all you, in my head. If you, do, if you don't take them alive, it looks like it's $5,500 to get rid of all the beavers and, and take care of all the dams. And if you want them alive, it's 11000 bucks. Am I right? So we have before us the question as to whether, I think, we want to participate in the removal of the dams or the, the scaling back of the dams and the removal of the beavers today for either $5,500 or $11,000. All in, everything covered. Is that right? Is that an accurate quote? No. What? Is it 5,500 in one time? Pardon? 5,500 if you kill them and get rid of the dams. That, that includes the dams, yes. All the dams. The seven dams that are marked on the Right, all the dams that are marked. Conservation approval. We have to go through I, Yeah, I get that part. Okay. Yes, is the answer, Mr. Hart. Okay. So, um, and to the point, and I think it's a good point, but I think it's sort of a fact of, of the situation. Any asset that we own, we're going to have to maintain it. In this case, we have to maintain something different than we typically maintain in a building or a truck or a fire apparatus, something like that. But I think we have to maintain it. So we bought the land. we got to deal with it. So I would suggest, uh, I would make a motion that the Board of Selectmen, uh, with the blessing of the Conservation Commission, uh, act and fund uh, the Beaver uh, remediation plan as presented. Okay, so the mo so maybe the, so maybe the chair will entertain a motion that for the purposes of protecting the town's property and because of the th the imminent threat to the residents' water supply, the town agree to 
participate in right in the in the expense of of um, of removing the beavers and beaver dams identified on this map, right? And in, in, maybe in conjunction with the proposal from Mr. Spiker. At the, at the direction of the Conservation Commission, maybe? Well, again, that just, that just has to happen anyway. We don't have to yeah, do well, anything yeah, so that's yeah, kind of right. the, well, That's kind of implied. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what what yes, what that's my the, motion. What about the difference in the, in the two prices and how, how much money we're actually Well, that's right. Pay. So the questions I left, I left open for people to talk about, because we haven't gotten that far yet, are the expense, how much we want to spend, how, much, how do we want to split it, and then, and then to the extent we want to direct whether they're live or not, how do we want to do that? So, so through the chair, uh, um, to uh, Mr. Speecher. So the, the live catch traps, they catch the beaver alive, but the beaver isn't re relocated, right? Oh, it's, it's still terminated. Rehabilitated. Right? And rehabilitated. It's not relocated. It's, it's still terminated, correct? Yes. Yes. Oh, really? So, so right. So no. just be clear. They catch it alive, but... They make it dead. They make it dead. Yeah, okay. We either have to shoot it or drown it. All right, you got to be a rug no matter what. So, okay. I intentionally left that out of my motion. <laughs> so I didn't want to be in the middle of that. All right. Uh, so, so we have a motion on the table, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So actually, so let me let me modify that. I was actually talking to three, but let me modify it. So the chairline had a motion that for the protection of the town's property at Fruit Street and because of the imminent threat to the water supply of the residents abutting, that the town uh, agreed to fund f agreed to fund fifty percent of the cost of this proposal. Um, Subject to the and and that the beavers not be required to be kept caught alive. So that would not that was not my motion. Okay. I don't know why we do fifty percent. Where's the rest of the money going to come from? Well, there isn't. So it's for the chair. I don't they don't have an associate. If they had an association, I would agree with you one hundred percent. But they don't have an association, so then they're going to get into a little bit of a contest about who's going to chip in and who's not going to chip in and blah blah blah. You know. I'd just rather keep it smooth and we're talking, this is not a budget breaker. Can I, can I ask one? Well, first of all, I guess we have to resolve the fact that there's a motion on the table. Well, it, it, was, it was just, I was just talking it through. I didn't, I didn't put it, make a motion. It was suggested, sort of, but I didn't write, so there's. Well, there was a motion, though. We but he sort of. Yeah, he but I backed of, off that he one. He backed off, and I was talking it through. So we still don't have a motion. So I was looking to build a motion out of it. First of all, the, the amount of money is relatively inconsequential. Um, I am I am still concerned about the precedent it sets as we move forward. And then my last thing is, you know, we're hearing that this has been kind of raised as a major concern since 2009, something like that, 2009, somewhere in that area. Has there have there been any quotes on beaver remediation before the town on the land on the other side of the stream? That's what I was That's asking relevant, earlier. But did you all ever look into this before? Chairman, if I could, I, the water levels have reached an unprecedented level. Come to just so, because he can't get you in the camera otherwise. <laughs> I mean, based on, you know, I've lived there for over eight years now. The water has reached unprecedented levels um, that we have not experienced before uh, this fall and winter. I'm sure Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sullivan can attest to the same, that the water levels coming up between their properties, mm -hmm. between 16 and 18, it's the, le the levels have never reached this high. Okay, before. so it wasn't an issue of this extremity before. You good? All right. Okay. Uh, All right, then, then uh, I'd like to try and propose a motion, if I may. Do you have a question before we well, do that? Well, just, you know, first of all, the, the homes are in a floodplain, right, Don? Obviously. This is the 2010. The town's GIS has the 2010. Um, FEMA has come out with 2014. We're waiting for our, uh, our uh, GIS consultant to give us access to that information as well. So, I mean, it shouldn't be that surprising that there's water there. Um, I'm, I'm willing to entertain talking about uh, the town participating in this, but at what point is the town assuming some, some liability for uh, the homeowner's property for a naturally occurring body of water. So let's say a couple of years from now the stream floods, is the town supposed to take action if it's not beaver related? If the beavers come back, what's our what's our obligation? I think that we would have to anything that we did would have to be the recognition that uh, you know we're not we're not responsible for future damage. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if I can't through the chair, uh, but we do. We should maintain. You know, if we're if we're going through and knocking down the the that dam number three, that's up by our Fruit Street land, we should we should put in our budget or our motion to maintain that every year so that we keep it at that three foot by six foot so we don't run into this. And if there are any other dams that go down down the down the lane or down the brook, that um, the other people could have to maintain their own. Mr. Major's question. Chair, is Tom Pratt still here? Yeah, we're here. Tom, what have, what have you done with the property in the past? Nothing. They, they come and they go in the summertime and stuff there. And stuff. But, uh, you know, it's getting a lot worse. I didn't realize there were seven dams there, you know. Mm -hmm. I always knew there was one that was across and the other side. You could get some every inch and wash up. They, they definitely have a problem. They've got to be addressed. Yeah, because I haven't been down back in quite a while, but other people have down there. Let's say it's really getting out of control. So but these guys are saying it's really getting flooded. So you, you've been, never seen it in this condition? Then. I haven't been down back to see uh, lately, but people have gone down and run their dogs and told me and stuff that mm -hmm. it is getting really bad. They've never seen this bad either. So. Okay. okay I'm good. Yeah. Good. Anybody else have any thoughts on this? Any suggestions on how to move this ahead? Were you going to make a motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we um, fund this along with maintenance to remediate the, uh, the, the present problem to protect our land and then to also look into berming some of our land in the future uh, around Fruit Street, around the... Uh, around why, don't the we, why don't we deal with the proximate issue first and then worry well, then about to, the to, to berming down yeah, the road? Yeah, money to... to uh, to remediate the problem and to uh, maintain it, maintain it in the future. Can I suggest that we worry about that maintenance part in the budget for next year? As it, right, if we want to do it, because right, because that sort of commits us to a budget decision that we can't make. We should. The thing we can do now is just sort of is sort of deal with the proximate issue. Then uh, back to. Uh, Mr. So you Hurst's want to motion. restate that motion, Mr. Chair? Well, that was back, back to back to your motion. I, I make a motion that we we fund the. Uh, uh, beaver specialist to remove the beavers and uh, uh, remove the dams down to three feet by six feet. Okay. And, uh, per the proposal. Whatever the cost is. Second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Discussion. So, a discussion. so I'd like to make sure that there's recognition that this is an acute and unusual situation, that this motion True. isn't committing the town to the long term. Right, that's a, that's a different discussion. You mean morally versus legally? Because it's obviously Actually, legally. if I could, that's... No, Jen, you can't just interrupt, okay? Right, you, have, you have to wait a second. I'll, if you have something, I'll come to you. So, go ahead. So I want to be careful here because... So there's, there's an acute problem that's affecting the residents, and I, I think that, it is, that it's, it's worthy of us taking a look, and from the description of it, it's worthy of us taking action. Uh, however, I don't think that obligates us in the future to be committed to... Um, to mediating this problem on an ongoing basis or flooding problems in general around that area. That's, that's a different discussion aside from, from this acute situation, I think. Okay. Two, two comments. First of all, um, I'm assuming that the motion is only for funds to take care of the issue right now. I know that uh, Mr. Speaker was also mentioning a follow-up and six months, I don't know if that's at additional cost, do we have to revisit it, or is it something that we can allocate some cap on now, or get an idea of how much it's going to be. Secondly, to Mr. Moser's point, I think that that's probably one of the reasons why we need to come up with, you know, some statement of what our rationale is for funding this, uh, so, that, so that we can use that as we move forward, whether it's on this property, or property on a different side of town. Okay. All right, so we have a motion in a second to fix the dam. And, and the, motion, the, the motion included the public health concern, correct? Well, it wasn't stated. We could, ta we could tag that on to the issue. I think the concern I'm hearing from, from both sides is, A, we not dig ourselves a precedent, make ourselves a precedent problem, and also that we not be, no one perceive us as committing to taking care of this in perpetuity just because we're doing it now. Is that what I heard from you? That's correct. Although I, my motivation is that it's uh, recognition of the Board of Health's recommendation. Right. Okay. Um, however, noting that the town has taken action, other parts of town 
um, culverts and things like that around flooding issues. And with you knowing the Board of Health, I do think it's appropriate to address this acute situation specifically. Right. But again, that was, I mean, the, the, again, the reason I like that president you mentioned is because that was to protect the town's property. Right. And so if it's to protect the town's property, it seems to me to be fairly clear, clear cut. We, did you have something else you want to say? So a couple of sort of administrative or procedural things. We're authorizing to spend money that's not in the budget today. So is the motion focused on public health? Because I think if we have a public health, health concern, we can address, uh, I believe we could address that outside of the annual budgeting process and town meeting and blah, blah, blah. So Mr. Kamalo, is this something we can act on? Does the rationale impact our ability to commit the funds? For, for example, protection of the town's property versus a public health concern. I think the only logical funding source for this project would be the, through the reserve fund. The reserve process. fund transfer. Yeah. Uh, and the argument is this was unforeseen. We did not know about this at the time the budget was approved. Okay. And they have, they have the appropriations committee has 5,000 bucks? They could? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> no, they'll say no. <laughs> just to be clear, yes. just to be clear, we have not reviewed the scope of work for this project. Okay. We have not reviewed the budget. We like the fact that the consultant is telling us it's going to be $5,000 on camera, so that's fine. Do we have to do an RFP for this? Yes, that now? was my follow-on. That's, that's, that's the other piece. We, depending on, based on the, based on the, on the amount that the consultant shared with us, the town needs to follow best business practices. Okay. Jen, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier, but we were in the middle of this. So did you, was there something you need to add? A couple of things I wanted to say about the Whitehall Brook. It's a tributary of the Sudbury River, and we are bound to maintain flow um, through a state and local level. So we, we can't, to your point, Todd, it was to simply say that you know, we're not going to be responsible as well. We kind of are from a, a water flow perspective. And as moving forward in the future, if this happens again and our wells are in fact threatened or have the imminent threat of being contaminated, then we will be responsible from a public health perspective to do right. something. Well, about just to be it. clear, you won't have that brook. <laughs> so, so it's not Apparently just us. That's responsible. No, that and the other that. thing is, I know we just signed a, communi a community compact agreement, and part of that was for best practices of. of business and it was for agriculture um, and the agriculture piece was for a farm it was that farm going to be on the Pratt property well again I, don't, I, 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 I appreciate your help to try funding, to find us get a rationale I think we're doing okay no, the, the rationale is just funding a funding source for right. it so if you're looking to you know build a farm on that but that farmland where that is going to be is flooded to mitigate that problem perhaps part of the community compact agreement funding grant could be earmarked for beaver. beaver mitigation okay. thank you Good. Okay, so we had a motion, and the motion was to uh, to uh, uh, basically agree to agree to fund. I think you were you said fund this proposal to remove the beavers. Mm -hmm. We had a question about whether or not that has a rationale attached to it, and I think you feel strongly about that, and I know I do. So, so the rationale for it being um, do we want to talk about that at all? What's the, what's the rationale you'd like to see attached to, the, to doing this? I think that, I think that um, to allow, to, I guess, to give us, uh, put us in the best position for the future, I think that it needs to be the rationale of uh, protection of public property. Okay. And I think that we do have that. At first, I, I didn't understand where the burns were and things like that. But, you know, percent that other areas of the property, um, you know, they are being encroached on or something to protect. Um, we do that and use that rationale. Moving forward, you know, obviously the town doesn't own land uh, around every beaver dam. Mm -hmm. So right. I think that helps us. Would you be okay with amending it to include oh, the rationale of being sure. the protection of public property? Would you be okay as a second for that? Yes, as long as I can add to that that we follow town procurement laws in, in, in the uh, uh, award of this work. Sure, I mean, I think that's implied. I think we can't do anything that's not legal. Well, when we talk about that proposal, that was, yeah, 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 you know right. what I'm saying? Okay. Subject to rights. So to subject to okay. town 
procurement okay. laws. So I think the amendment as a so tell me if this if I'm relaying what you want to do, which is for for the purposes of protecting town property, you you move that the board agree to fund um, uh, uh, remediation RFP. remediation of the dam and beaver issue on the Whitehall Brook, so according to this proposal, subject to um, following the town's RFP process. Correct. That's a good Does motion. That, does that express what you want? That's fine. Does that express what you seconded? Yes. Do you have a question, Mr. Mosher? Well, so I, I don't agree with that because okay. we also bought property with a floodplain. And as uh, Mr. Pratt stated, it comes and it goes, and that's the way it's always been. My motivation is the fact that these folks uh, are in danger of contaminating their water in this particular instance. So you're, you're so, bothered more by the rationale than the, right. than the fact that so, so if there, if there is a desire for the town to maintain this on an ongoing basis to protect future uses, I think that's a separate discussion. But I, I feel like they have an acute issue that is, um, and out of the priorities of that, contamination of the water is the motivator for me. Okay. Mr. Sitar, do, do you have a counter to that? I think that? Yeah, I think that if we were to zero in on the public health issue being contamination of the water, you know, that's certainly something I can buy into. The thing I want to avoid is, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier somebody you know, having the same issue, but they're not on well water, I mean, they're on town water, but they come up with something around, you know, it's bringing the beavers closer to my home, and there's beaver dung all over the lawn, and, you know, my kids are going to eat it. You know, and that's a public health issue. You know, I don't want something crazy like that happening. And here's... And, I'll come to, and here's my issue with that, which is we don't actually know that there's a public a threat to their wells, right? They've asserted it. Well, I think we believe it, right? Innately, we accept it, mm. but but we haven't actually validated that in any level, right? We don't actually know it to be true. We do know, however, that the fact that there's water on our property, it may or may not be seasonal, but it's clearly getting worse. We heard that. And we also heard from Mr. Hurd that they think it's important that they, they have, you know, can plan to have maximum access to the property going forward. So the the... It's, it's consistent with what we've done before, which is take care of beavers to, to protect town infrastructure. It doesn't, it doesn't go down a path of, of is, are their wells really endangered, which from a diligence perspective, we'd sort of have to do if we really want to make this argument. You have to support it in some fashion. And so I, I, I worry adding that. And, and it also, to Mrs. Sestari's point, really broadens out the mandate under which we'll get involved in these things going forward, which I'm not sure I want to do a priori. So then let's, let's forget about that then. Okay. And just and just consider that that we recognize that this is this is causing a problem. The town has chosen to maintain this stretch of waterway okay. to the benefit of both us as property owners and and the residents that abut it. Well, again, we can argue that essentially they're, they're, from this if we take that pathway, the impact on them is almost irrelevant, right? Because we're doing it to protect right. the towns, Mr. Okay. Patino. Yeah. yeah. W w with that, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to you know, snatch defeat. Not snatch defeat from, from the jaws of victory, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and we have a second. The motion is that for the purposes of protecting town property, the town fund beaver removal on the Whitehall Brook per this um, per this proposal, subject to it at fulfilling the town's uh, requirements for for uh, an RFP process. I think is that yes, sir. Yeah, nothing in there currently about future maintenance. No, I think that's a budget question. Right. Questions? Questions? Comments? Well, well just, just going forward, could, is there some capacity the town could have to evaluate this so that three years from now we don't have another eight dams? I, yeah, I, I agree. I think that that's a future discussion, you know, in the future, maybe, you know, next week or the week after yeah. or two months from now. But it seems like an awful lot of dams that are inactive on, on that stretch seems to me like overall you'd be better off to evaluate whether cleaning it up would be a better, uh, better thing. Okay. Well, good. And I hesitate to look for trouble, but does the board want the beavers alive or alive and then dead or dead and then dead? Teach me a lesson. For the board's information. I'll come right back to you. Yeah. Yes. For Let's the board's on. information, the, the Conservation Commission does have a process for reviewing Beaver mitigation plans. Okay. So, so can we leave it to them to give to decide what what they think is the best ma manner of? S certainly, in this regard, we we will have to go through that process. If we're going to do any breaching of the dams. No, but no, no. I'm in, in terms of actually what happens to the beavers. 
do, do they have do they have in, input into that as well? But the commission is just a regulatory authority. The town would be the applicant saying, "This is what we want to we do." We want to do and right. Then the commission would say, okay. "That's in compliance with the state and town laws, weather laws, right. or it's not." You'd have to alter. It. Okay. All so beaver action. huggers or beaver ruggers? What are we here? I was going to say, so, can I make a amendment to have five hats made? <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm not even going there. I'm not even going. All right, who's a beaver hugger? Done. Anybody? Anybody want a live beaver? <laughs> do you have oh, something, oh, do you have oh, something incredibly really germane to this? There. Yes. One so, brief comment. Yes. The residents have aligned around the use of the conibear style traps. Live or dead? Uh, th those are the kill traps. Those okay, dead, traps. dead beavers. Okay, so the residents vote dead. Um, so, well, okay, so now I do have a question. <laughs> Please, go ahead. For, mi for Mr. Speaker, so are these going to be submerged traps? Sorry? Are these going to be submerged traps? Yes. Okay. By law, all kind of traps must be underwater. Okay. Is this a humane? Uh, here's why I like everybody. Is this a humane? Pet thing, pet thing, kid thing. No, it's fine, but I want to know. Me, is this a humane method of, of getting rid of the beers? The most humane, yes. No suffering, no no untoward well, pain. And I understand that you guys don't understand much about beavers because beavers don't even do feces on the yard. It's all in the water. Yeah, but tell me, do, do we, do we, I mean, right, when you kill the beaver, is it unnecessarily painful or cruel? Or? When the beaver is caught in the conibear style trap yep. under the better management practices, which is a very humane trap of uh, 2007, yep. when that jaw closes or those wires come together, the equivalent is two cars hitting at 150 mile an hour. So it just smushes the beaver. They don't know what hit them. Okay. They don't flex. They don't move. Okay. They don't so it's drown. not incredibly it's painful. No, humane. you're not drowning a beaver. Okay. No. Go. If it's no. properly set, it's it's in, supposed to be instantaneous. Okay. But the live catch actually stresses the animal out until they're terminated. Got it. Okay. So fine. As long as it's humane. So does the board, uh, as a final element of this motion, um, would the board uh, would anyone like to, to to amend this to include a discussion of live versus kill traps? I suggest, Mr. Herman. <laughs> What's the beaver vote? It's his motion. <laughs> what do you want? Uh, do it the most cost efficient way. C okay, he, Mr. Catino votes for the lowest cost method. Which is likely the most humane. Okay. You're, are you okay with the amendment? Yes. Okay, so in the final element of this being using the lowest, lowest cost method. Okay, so we have a motion. We had a second. We had discussion. Does anybody have a second for discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, president not voting, that's unanimous. Okay, go forth and deal with the beaver issues once you get approval. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you all for coming in. Sorry to be, but it, just got to move it along. Huh? You know, it's, it's always these ones that burn you, that it gets you. Huh? Okay, we're going to go back now and pick up on, uh, what am I going to pick up on here now? Ms. Kamal, do we have anybody here for licenses, or can I just go back and start from scratch? Ms. I see a couple license holders. All right, so let's do the licenses then. We're going to move to item 8 on the agenda, liquor licenses, 2016 changes in hours of operation policy. It's an action item. The board will review hours of operation policy for restaurants and related establishments and then consider approving nine licensing requests for a change in hours or other aspects of their license. And we have said draft regulations <coughs> that were circulated earlier today. Um, and, um, and we also have a, a discussion of service um, obligations. Mr. Kamalo, can you talk to the board about what you did since last time we had a long discussion? We said go off and draft a policy. We made some recommendations for it. Can you talk about what we're looking at here and, um, and also what the council advised with regard to some of the issues? Yes, through the chair. Um, there was a question from the last discussion by the board from Mr. Sestari uh, regarding the um, the package store service hours. Uh, town Council responded back and said uh, clearly they couldn't find uh, a legal case that will guide the board's decision. However, their recommendation would be uh, for the board to adhere to the as of right service hours for package stores. So that's the response we received. In terms of drafting the policy, I'm suggesting, Mr. Chair, that perhaps I walk the board section by section in, uh, and only focus on the sections that perhaps introduce new concepts okay. or touch upon issues that the board has discussed or raised in prior license review discussions. Go ahead, Mr. Kamal. Okay, first page, 
As I indicated, um, under licensing authority, this is an issue that I think the board has uh, um, asked the town manager and town council to raise through the charter review committee, where clearly we will identify the board of selectmen as the licensing authority in town. That's on uh, section, section three. And then moving on, um, general guidelines. What I tried to do in this section was to identify the items that the board has discussed in the past as the factors that identify public need and common good. So I've provided a listing of those items. If the board has any additional factors that you believe should be added to this section, please let me know. Again, the idea is to give definition and meaning to public need and common good. Uh, under the section six, the application process, we're now clearly identifying that there are two application forms to be uh, completed by the applicant, one for the APCC and the other for the local licensing authority, which is the town. Uh, Subparagraph C, under application, I'm also interested in hearing from the board whether you would like us to identify the requirements for one-day licenses. These are special licenses that the board issues for special events. Interesting concept in paragraph D, carry your own booze license. Town currently does not have that facility. However, in, 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 in some offline discussions, uh, observations have been made in regard to the fact that the town is very close to reaching its limits in terms of how many licenses the town can issue. Uh, this is an instrument uh, that other towns have used to address that issue where they identify specific locations, specific uh, establishments that may require the bring your own booze license. Not currently covered in our regulations, not currently allowed in town, so the choice is twofold. The board can, if the board is inclined to allow bring your own booze uh, licenses in town, we can develop a regulation for that. Alternatively, if the board is not inclined to support this concept, I suggest that we add specific language prohibiting this. Okay, moving on. Um, payments and refunds, we felt uh, at staff level that it was important to have this paragraph. Uh, Often we hear questions as to whether we can prorate uh, license fees. We want to expressly forbid that. Uh, hours of permitted sale. Uh, following the last discussion, I did meet with the uh, owners of four restaurants that close at 1 a.m. Uh, and explained to them the concept that the board was considering. Uh, and their reaction was twofold. One, they were interested in maintaining their weekend hours. Um, the establishments that close at 1 all confirm that they do conduct business as late as uh, 12.30, where they do uh, specifically at cause um, hold special events, uh, and on those days they have uh, quite a large number of uh, clients who order meals after 12 p.m., at uh, uh, 12 midnight, sorry. And then they also mentioned the impact of uh, spe special sporting events that okay late during the week. They cited specifically Monday night football, Thursday night football, as well as Sunday night football, uh, and their clientele comes to the restaurants specifically to enjoy a dinner as well as uh, watch those games. In addition, uh, all the four owners mentioned the impact of the proposed law on New Year's Eve celebrations. Should they okay during the week, they may not be able to have clients celebrate the coming of the new year. Um, and so what I did was I included under um, section 8, uh, paragraph A, item number 4, that the board could consider New Year's Eve hours uh, for these establishments. Uh, and then in, 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 in light of the comments that were made by Todd, I draw your attention to subparagraph B under section 8, hours of operation. 
the hours of operation may not coincide with the hours of permitted sale. And again, this will depend on whether the, the, the board agrees to issue licenses for package stores outside the, or less than the, as of right hours. Yes. Um, and then outdoor services. Um, I want to point out to you, this is under licensed premises, uh, section B, outdoor services. Um, we, in the past years, have entertained several requests for outdoor services based on the questions that the board has asked during the review of those uh, requests. I've included six criteria that the board could include as part of its review of similar requests. I should mention the six items go beyond what is identified in the APCC regulations, and the town has the discretion to do this. Um, the next item of interest is under management background checks. Um, again, based on comments that I've heard from the board, uh, there's an interest in making sure that the management team uh, complies with the law. So what we've done is we've asked, added the assistant manager to the list of individuals that uh, the board would like to see uh, or review their backgrounds. Uh, in, in addition, notice that we also in the past have had to review um, individuals that are linked to uh, the funding sources for the establishment. Uh, we have included language that, that would account for that discussion. And then um, the other interesting concepts I draw your attention to page six and a transfer. Uh, we have identified different categories or instances when transfers can occur, uh, and I have asked Town Council to review this concept further. We want to establish instances in which any transfer of a property that currently is a licensed establishment could result in an automatic transfer of the license to the new owner. We just want to make sure that the town fully understands that concept. And uh, section 16, abandonment of license, that is new, it's a new concept. Um, uh, I think part of the discussion regarding these establishments has focused on uh, ensuring that this is a vibrant line of business in town. And so we have added language where the town needs to be notified if the establishment is abandoned for a period greater than three months. And then violations. Um, based on prior discussions from the board, I've thrown around a concept where at least there is some consistency in which the board can um, issue um, uh, its discipline um, relative to violations. Uh, first offense, warning to three days suspension. Second offense, three to seven days suspension. Third offense, seven to 12 days suspension. Fourth offense, possible revocation. Um, I also left out a couple of sections that the board Bless may you. consider asking us to include in this policy. Bless you. Uh, special one day licenses, as I, pre I, as I explained previously. There's also the farm series pouring permits. Uh, we, we, the, I think in the past the board uh, ran into this issue when you were considering the freshwater farm license as well as uh, when we had requests uh, for uh, participants in the farmer's market uh, who were interested in serving alcohol. Uh, and then finally, there's the carry-in license. This is the issue that I described uh, to the board. So in summary, those are the new issues that I want to highlight to the board for your discussion. Uh, again, I am open to receiving your feedback and comment. Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Kamala, for the summary. Um, does the board, who wants to start off? Mr. Mosier, you got any questions on this? Uh, well, first I'd like to thank thoughts Mr. Kamalo. This is a considerable amount of effort he put into this. Amen. Um, well, just point <coughs> there wasn't something named after each one of us. Um, 
Just a quick comment on the violations. Um, I think we, you know, if we if we adopt something like that, I just want to make sure that we note that those are only guidelines, and the and the board wouldn't be restricted to those. And if there was um, extenuating circumstances, that we would have the liberty to impose whatever violation we saw fit. Okay. Um, around the um, section 12 licenses, I'd like to go right to that and just. Talk about the hours because I feel like this is what this is all going to boil down to Sunday through Thursday, 11 to 11, uh, Friday and Saturday, 11 to 12. Mr. Kamala noted that there was um, some establishments serving food as late as 1230. I still like the idea of a, a kind of a blanket uniform time across town. Uh, so is it, is it 12? Is it 1? Is it 1230? H3. So, well, I can't find it. Section, so oh, there we go. Got it. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're talks about the time. So I guess that's, those are my comments. I guess I'd like to you know, okay. we're gonna have a discussion, sort of have around the format time. Right. Does anyone want to start with high level comments or should I just walk through the section by section and we can talk about each of the pertinent issues? Is, our, is that a good, a good pathway to go through this? Are you, are you okay? So it was just high level kind of, uh, yeah. to Mr. Kamala. Was there any statistical information or information maybe provided by the chief that showed any kind of public safety issues around times, you know, of 12 a.m. versus 1 a.m. for incidents, alcohol related incidents, if there was, if it made a difference, if that was looked at? No, at this point, we don't have that information from the chief. We, could, we can ask for it. Wow. Uh, specifically, are you looking for information? Uh, on um, cases that are tied to alcohol in general or alcohol related to establishments in town? I, well, I think it would be related to establishments in town to stay relevant. Okay. Good Did you have some or can I just start, should I start going yeah, through yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just go walk through this on a page by page basis. So. Really, so definitions, I assume we have no issues with. Licensing authority, I think, would be us. We talked about that. General guidelines, again, this has been put together based upon what we've raised up during license reviews. Does anybody have any, any items they want to add, or are they okay with this generally, the general guidelines? It's I'm okay with it. Okay. Public hearing and application are all relatively standard. I mean, that's sort of, um, um, that's all things we typically ask for, Ms. Kamala, right? So you're just codifying what we've always done. Yes. Special one-day license. So here's the first question. Is, are there things we'd like to add? I will note that we always have the exact same questions every time there's a request for one-day license. Are they TIP certified, right? Is there going to be someone, a manager on the location? Um, what are the other things you always ask? Um, Chief, do you have any comments? Right. Well, that, that, some of that will still have to come. But right, so maybe that should, we should codify that it should always come through with, with comments from the permitting team, right? You know, to your point, you know, include, to include the chief of police. So, Mr. Kamal, I think those, you know, there's three or four things we always ask those questions. Maybe we could just put in there that, so that we automatically always have the answers. Um, first big question for the board, do we want to talk about a carry-on license? Yeah, we'll talk at that later. Okay, so board, uh, two, two I'm thoughts not, on that? I'm not interested. Okay. So no BYOB. Okay. So sensing no interest in a BYOB discussion, we're going to, does the board, let me say, uh, does the board feel strongly enough that people want to proactively prevent, uh, prevent it, or do we just want to stay silent? I, did, I, I think we should possibly talk, if we start running out of licenses and restaurants want to come in, then we should, then we should look at it. I don't know if we should say we prohibit it. Do we have to say we prohibit it? No, no, no. It was just one of the options he raised. I just want to make sure people had the full set of choices. Okay. So it seems like, it, is that okay? Does anybody feel strongly against this, or should we just stay silent on it for now? I, I think just stay silent. Okay. So we'll stay silent on the, on the carry-in. Common victualler is standard. The fees, Mr. Kamalo, are the same uh, as right there, just codifying what's already in there? Yeah. Hours is the next big topic. So again, what we had talked about, and this is Mr. what Mr. Mosier had broached, was this um, uh, this concept of, of somewhat differential hours um, uh, in Section 12 and Section 15. Um, do people like what they see? How do they? Can you just define what's what's a tavern licensee? What's, what's considered a tavern licensee? Um, Tavern, tavern license is um, 
when you have a boarding room that you allow to sell alcohol, that's what generally is called considered a tavern. Boarding room. Boarding room. Yes. Hotel. Hotels. Inns. Okay. And and by state statute, unless we file something else, they're not allowed to sell on Sundays. That is correct. Currently, we have no situations like that. Do you not have taverns in town that we are aware of? Okay. So section. So what we've done here is we had talked about we'd gone about back and forth about a bunch of different ideas about what to do on ours, and I think what we did is came back and said one essentially one zone, the whole town has the same hours. And so we do 11 Sunday through Thursday and midnight Friday and Saturday, and then we the holidays are basically the same as what's in Mass General Law. And then that's Section 12, which is basically restaurants, and Section 15 is liquor stores, and that's really state law. Yes, Mr. Sistar. Can you just get some more clarification on the holiday component? It's saying um, uh, service of alcohol beverages prohibited between 1 a.m. and midnight on Memorial Day and Christmas Day. So no sales on Memorial Day and Christmas Day. Um, or, the fall, or, the, or the day following when Christmas Day is a Sunday. So Christmas Day is a Sunday and there's no sales on Monday unless the town adopts MGL 138.33B. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That is correct. Okay. So I, I'd just like to, I know we don't have to do it in this motion, but I would just suggest that if we accept this section, which there's no choice, that's state law, um, that we also file for adopting MGL 138.33B. Okay. So you'd like to adopt the law and let us sell alcohol on the Monday following Christmas when it occurs on a Sunday. Okay. The anniversary. December 26th? Yeah. No touching. Okay. Thank you. We'll put that in. We'll make it a holiday. Todd C. X. M. A. S. Law noted. Okay. Anybody want to talk about that? We don't have to decide that now anyway. This just we we could figure that out down the road once the policy is broadly done. Okay. I agree with that. Liquor store hours are section 15, and that's basically what the state says. Right, Mr. Kamala. That is correct. Okay. Hours of operation may not coincide with the hours of permitted sale. So that just says that they can be open for less than the uh, league than the permitted hours. Yes. Okay. Does anybody have any I'm confused. About that? So section 15 is liquor store hours per Mass General Law. That's package. Package. Right. Section 12 are the various establishments in town. Basically restaurants, yeah. And what did we decide there? The, the point is that what, the, what's, what Part B says is you don't have to be open all those hours. If you want to close at 9 or open at 1, what, you know, p.m., whatever, you can do it. You can do what you like as long as you're with, oh, not open outside those hours. But what if someone wants to stay open until 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday? Slide, then they'd have to apply for, for a specific license waiver from the Board of Selectmen. For that for year night. or for that night? For that, for one day, night they want to do it? No, uh, okay. For every night of the week, every Saturday they want to stay up until one. They'd have to put that in their license application. The board of selectmen would have to approve it outside the boundaries of this policy. So this is the general, but we're going to allow for individuals to extend a little bit if necessary. It, well, so it's the board's discretion. Right, okay. But they can, they can always apply. We just don't have to grant. In general, all licenses will be within these hours. Again, the, the Part B says that we, you can be open less than those hours. We're, we're not going to be concerned about it. This goes to the concept of simplifying the license so every single license doesn't have every single hour delineated when they're all different. Okay. And if you want to go beyond that, you have to apply, and then we have to agree to waive it. Okay. Questions on that? Yes, yeah, but, but, see, but uh, to Mr. Kamala's point about Monday night football, uh, Thursday night football, and Sunday night football, you know, the, you know we really have... To me, you know, the again, um, you know, the market will decide to some extent, and so you know, then so will the the restaurants respond if they want to if they want to be open. I I I I've been saying, um, you know, make it make it a midnight um, across the board, and and why should we say you know, a, a Sunday? You know, it's it's you know, I'm a I'm a big church goer, and uh, but I still believe that um, if somebody mm -hmm. wants to watch the end of the end of the uh, eight o'clock game, and it gets over at uh, at midnight. That they should be able to watch it. And I don't want to be just. I, I, have, I have another question. It's kind of tied to the hours because I think it may affect the various establishments. 
Um, can, can there be uh, a requirement that uh, alcohol can only be sold up to one hour after no food is available in an establishment? You know, we can go ahead. Yes, the, the, the board can decide to have that rule. But I thought that after the last board meeting, there was no interest on the I board's think part fairly in linking yeah. food to when alcohol can be saved. That's why I left this out. I don't remember that part of the conversation. Well, we talked. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, no, I, my, my very clear recollection is there was discussion about making tying food to alcohol service, and there was no interest in that at yeah, all. Yeah, we were dis uh, discussing um, Bill's Pizza and whether that was going to be. But it was also generally. Yeah, I, I called right, it the Utah rule right. or something. Yeah, it came, it came up during that, during that discussion. Well, Maria's well, restaurant. We're off topic, though, because Mr. Well, Maria's restaurant actually tried doing that. They wouldn't allow people just to sit at the bar without eating, and, and they didn't last. Well, again, that's water under the bridge. We, I think the board decided not to do it. I think the question at hand is your question, which is you, you want longer hours. Basically, and I think that the people that are open to one may be more amenable to just closing one hour earlier rather than telling them that they have to close two hours earlier, yet make it across the board midnight. And, and I think that, that many of the restaurants may buy into that. I don't know that anybody in town is open until 1 a.m. every night of the week. Is anybody, is that, I thought that was only weekends. Is any, does anybody have a 1 a.m. every night license? If one... Every night? Every night. I believe so, yes. Oh, okay. I can check the, I can check the spreadsheet quickly. Okay. I just, I just also wanted to make a distinction between the example that Mr. Tino gave, where there's a requirement to buy food if you sit in an area, as opposed to food being available to patrons. Oh, sure. Right, right, right. And in my scenario, it could be extremely limited. Yeah. Yeah. So does anybody want to revisit the hours discussion, which is currently 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 a.m. to midnight Friday and Saturday? I would. Catino does, but is, any, is there any other interest in this? I'm good with it. As long as we can do that individual license to one, I'm fine. Okay. You're, you're fine? Okay. I think the consensus is the board's generally... I know you don't like it, but I mean, there is a mechanism for people to apply to get outside of it. And I think that's an important point. But again, that doesn't, but, uh, but that doesn't level the playing field. It's... Well, it it's level now, because everyone has to close at the same time. I would unlevel it by letting some people stay open later. But, and would the, but, but what, what kind of a hurdle would we make for the four restaurants that currently already have a one o'clock license? Support, well, they've already got their license granted for the year. It supports discretion. Okay, just. Uh... I think it just becomes a question of, again, it, to, to me it's always been a question of cost benefit. And, and my concern, I told you, is that downtown, I don't, I don't think downtown should be, should be a late night area. It's resident heavy. And so um, um, when we were talking about two zones, I was much less concerned about it over at 495. But I, I just, I, I fairly strongly feel like, you know, if you live downtown, you should be able to have a quality of life. It doesn't get far enough. Does the board want to talk about 12.30 a.m.? Mr. Kamala. To an earlier question, establishments in town that currently close at 1 a.m., Connell's, Dynasty, Cause, and the proposed 110 Grill. Every night? Yes. So, it, so it's Dynasty, <coughs> Cornell's, and Restaurant? Oh, Co, up in South Street. And then so, it basically the, except, so it's basically all things outside the center of town. Okay. Does the board want to talk about a 12.30 a.m. New Year's Eve? Fine with it. Good. Okay, so Ms. Kamal, let's go to 12. Yeah, I assume you're good with it, 1230. It's fine. Okay, so Ms. Kamal, let's do 1230 on, on New Year's. Um, floor plans, it looks like we're not changing anything. Oh, um, board need to increase need on outdoor service. I'm good with that. And so you, the, your thought, Ms. Kamal, is what? We want, we want to incentivize more outdoor or opportunities or, there's, or we need to control them more tightly? I, I think the idea is there they will be a need for these services and therefore to help 
the town will work alongside the proponents. Right. Um, we're communicating the requirements um, that will allow this to happen. Okay. We've identified six criteria. I, I personally would like these requirements to be reasonable but not terrible, not burdensome, because I think this is the kind of thing we should encourage. Coming back to what we should encourage. Should we, uh, should we? I want, we're going to go to, I'm going to go to folks for, I want to get through this and then go to folks for comments, because right, I know we've got some people who um, have restaurants in town. Yeah, yeah, well, we, I, need, I have something on to do. Um, yeah, I think the outdoor service is, is fine. I think that outdoor service versus entertainment outside, you know, two different issues. Right. right. So, again, so, uh, are people more or less good with this? Mr. Kamal, is this, would this be perceived, do you think, as, as a terribly burdensome set of rules, or is this generally what we put people through now? Um, again, the, bo the board may already be requiring this. Yeah, okay. The board has already raised these issues in prior discussions, yep. but it may be helpful perhaps for me, to, again, to sit down with the, with the owners and, and get right. their feedback. So, so through the chair, I mean, I, li I like the guidelines. Just a couple of them to me seem... Uh, like <clears throat> the exterior premises must be staffed at all times when open. That, that just seems like it would be difficult from a practical standpoint. Um, I don't think that suggests someone's hanging out out there. It's just that they're in, yeah, well, yeah, in the middle of the winter monitoring it. You know. So is that is that the intent? The just, just that somebody's available to go out there, or somebody standing it out in that? Doesn't area. say physically present yeah. to the staff. Somebody's okay. assigned. Right. To monitor the area. Okay, right. yeah. I'm good then. Okay, uh, <coughs> management is by and large what we've talked about, except for the background check portion. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I had something. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Sure, uh, Mr. Up on the um, changes, modifications yep. to license premises. The only one that that uh, for the purpose of this regulation, a substantial change includes, but not limited to a change sufficient to require a building permit. We, one of the things we have to be careful there is you know, when somebody puts in a water heater, it's a building permit. You change the toilet, building permit. Actually putting in lighting fixtures, it's a, you, unless you have a, 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 a permit pulled for the year and, a, and, a, and an electrician is signed. So we have to be careful of what that level is. Okay. And not make it, not make it make it uh, too draconian that they have to, you know, they're going to put in a new toilet, they have to come see us first. Well, it's something that alters the physical layout. The alters the physical layout of the bar or, the, or, or something in the, because if they're pulling a permit, permit for, the, for the restaurant, is it? Well, here's the problem, right? I, we, gotta, we, gotta be, we, want, we don't want to go too far in one direction, we don't want to go too but, far in the other direction. I think this leaves it to the discretion of the Board of Selectmen, which I think we generally want to do. I don't think it necessarily, Mr. Kamal, does this, I mean, one of Mr. Catino's de minimis scenarios. How would we handle that? They'd come in and say, "We want a whatever, uh, you know, yeah. our water heater conked out." What I happens? Know. I think the, the regulation is clear, as Mr. Sister correctly pointed out. This section specifically refers to physical changes to the licensed pre premises. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, okay. And if you want That's to clarify, sure. we can say physical yeah. Yeah. layout. Yeah. 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 Physical. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thank okay, so fine. Okay, so are you good? Great, I'm great. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Um, background checks uh, um, do, again, this just gives us a little, more a little more flexibility in determining how to issue licenses. We've oftentimes talked about public need, um, uh, and this just, I think, gives us the option to, to use that as, a, as an explicit condition. Right, Mr. Kamala? Yes, and, and again, the key change here being adding the assistant manager as well as right. any person with a financial interest in the license. Okay. I like that. Anybody got any comments on that? Uh, I like it. Nice Re work. Requirements on operation. Yes, sir, Mr. Sestari. Okay. Does anyone want to add any requirements on, on operation? Again, there's a host of things we could do. Um, are they viewed as being um, critical from a policy perspective? So is there any of these that currently we, we don't have? I mean, I think we already have all this. Mr. Kamal, are these things already required nowadays? Not wow. in the town's regulations. Right. <laughs> They're actually not in there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Now, again, I think the question is, it, it's a question of maintaining flexibility versus <laughs> establishing minimum requirements. Uh, There's uh, no need for a toilet facility uh, at a bar, is there? <laughs> I think him I don't I don't think I see anything here that I wouldn't want. Yeah. So okay. I think it'd be a good uh, good ad. So we want to see this with those those yeah. items listed? Yeah. Okay. 
alcohol training, Ms. Kamal, this is all standard three. stuff, right? This is all in there? Yes. Currently? Um, again, the, the new idea requiring that the assistant manager also be trained. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes good sense. Uh, insurance, inspections, that's all as, as is. Transfer, we have a question for town council. Yeah. But so that's a, just a factual question. Abandonment duration, violation. Well, abandonment duration are the are same as it ever was. Um, violation. Molly Conlon, this would be, I, I agree 100% Mr. Mosher's, well, I, you know, Mr. Mosher talked about this, about the, um, the violations, the enforcement. Again, I think, I think we just, and we do have, in this comment about giving us the opportunity. I'd actually like to put in, my, my thought would be, the third offense should be 7 to 12 days suspension up to rev revocation. I think, it's, I think after two, on your third in offense, you should, we should start having a conversation about revocation as opposed to having to wait to the fourth. So I, I'm not saying we have That's to do it. I'm just saying I want to make it clear that we have the option. You know, it's more. So if you put third offense up to revocation, then fourth offense is rev revocation, not possible I revocation. So. I, think, I think that would be. Yeah, I think third offense definitely should be the possibility of revocation. Yeah. We and then the fourth, it's, the fourth is the we bind line? ourselves that that's it. Okay, because one of the things I was just thinking of, after change of ownership, does the clock start again? Well, again, it's the board's discretion. Okay, right? no, that's one of the things I'm just. If know, it's bad behavior and you continue bad behavior, I don't think I don't think you get to buy just because. No, you I also want it to be be on the license itself. So if if the license changed hands, like I was just thinking about the package store up the street that they're being sold now. Does that strike go against those new owners? I think it's up to us. Up, I think up it's up. I mean, you have something where, a, say, somebody's brother bought the establishment and ran. Right. Right. Yeah, the sham transfer. Or something or the. the Somebody had already worked the there. So. Manager, the prior manager advised that. Yeah, right. Yes. right. Mm -hmm. The manager was actually the person who was more hands on responsible for uh, the violations. So, so I think this is good to have guidelines for when something comes up. You can at least consider it, but we've got to have flexibility in there. Okay. Yeah, I, I think part I, I B agree. Gives I think there needs to be flexibility. I, don't, I, I think somebody mentioned, you know, number four being revocation, you know, not possible revocation. I think that all situations need to be looked at. Uh, well, again, subparagraph two gives us all that. That basically yeah. says this is a guideline, but we can do it. You know, we have, we could obviously, we will obviously consider. So, Ms. Kamal, I think we should do a third offense should be seven to twelve day suspension up to revocation, and then the fourth should be revocation, and then and then part two mitigates that by saying we don't have to. You know, we, if we choose not to revoke, we're not forced to revoke. But people should know what to expect, I think, if they come in with a fourth violation. Mr. Herr. Mr. Kamal, just a typo. The word is severe in par paragraph two under B, enforcement, towards the bottom there, just left-hand side, severe. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, if, if two gives us the flexibility, then why do we need to go beyond item three and have number four be revocation? If item three is saying 712 up to possible revocation, then there's a possibility of revocation from that point on. And since we're given the flexibility, we still. So you just remove number four. Number four, yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, Brad. Sorry. Uh, fees for one-day licenses, Mr. Kamala, are you you're looking to see if we want to impose any, or do you have suggestions? No, um, it's for the board to think about this. Uh, clearly, one-day license, it, it currently, I think, is it 15 bucks, Maria? Yeah, 15 bucks. Is this something that the board wants to maintain, or you want us to look at? Fees. Anybody feel strongly? I'm sorry, fees? The question is the fees are that's really de minimis now, and so the question is do we want to keep them that way or does the board want to maybe look at, at a more broader set and see so, what fees t more typically are? So through the chair, I mean, we're not going to balance the budget on that, but is, is, is there like, if, I mean, how long does it take to prepare these? If it's like five hours, we should probably consider that. Yeah, um, honestly. We've, we've done preliminary studies uh, in terms of how we cost licenses. Um, Can we have the fee for the transfer of a license be a percentage of the sale? Other jurisdictions do that, but <coughs> at this point, given the number of licenses that the town deals with, that may not be necessary. Mm -hmm.
yeah. than most of the fundraisers. I, I know that in some communities you have a liquor license, and you know, when, when it's sold from one proprietor to another, you know, it can be tens of thousands of dollars. You know, um, um, I want to make that transfer a percentage. And if they don't want to pay the percentage, then they can. This is for the special one day licenses? No, no, no. I'm talking about the, the fees for transfers to licenses. Oh, oh, oh. You know, uh, again, are we trying to make money on it? I don't know if we yeah. should. Yeah, I don't know, but it's. For that? Yeah. If someone's buying a license, they're getting a license from us for $1,800, and then they're selling that license before other people who've been waiting in line to. You know, open up a new liquor store in town or a new restaurant per se, um, and then they go and sell it for say twenty thousand. I know right now we're not under this thing where you know there's there's a lot of people clamoring for licenses that we don't have. But if the demand goes up, you know, why should why should they take full time? I just think we're getting into the market based. You know, economy of taverns and bars and liquor licenses or package stores in town. I just see, I just see, you know, dollar <coughs> transfer fee or ten percent, whichever is higher. Ten percent of the sale price of the license. I'm open to talking about it, but can we talk about it in the context of what, and more data on what other people do? Could we maybe go off and yeah, if other towns do that, then we want to compete and be reasonable and get a reasonable margin, or I shouldn't say margin, but you know, revenue stream for the town. I'm okay with that. Can but let's get, get some get data. data. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So can we just gather data and we'll revisit it's an interesting this idea. what that says? And, and, and if, I, if I can comment Valid. on the one-day license. Yes, sir. I, I don't think we should charge. Two, mo most of these one-day licenses are for charity groups, but I think we should be able to pay for at the time that the town hall employees... Can you come back with a recommendation, Mr. Kamala, acknowledging that right that these are by and large right. nonprofits, and, yeah. but we just want to cover our costs. Okay. Okay. And then the just final. To, just to be clear, sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Under D, um, after D, sorry, after D, the sections 19 and 20. Right, that's all carry out. Y yes. Um, yeah. But 21, we we were taking that out. Right. Do Agreed you that. want us to develop more specific regulations for special one-day licenses and farm series public permits? You can standardize that. Right? We again, we ask the same questions every time. Why don't we just list the, the exact the questions we want to answer, so we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Okay. I don't. I, well, let, let's see what you come up with. But, but we're going to stay with nonprofits being zero, correct? Yeah. It's the one-day liquor license elsewhere or for other entities. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Okay. okay. Um, any more questions from the board? Do you all, as, as liquor license holders in town, have anything you want to say, or questions you want to ask, or comments on any of this? If you do, just come up to the to the podium. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for your service and your time. Uh, Paul Winchman, 27 Elizabeth Road. Uh, as you probably know, I am one of the proprietors in town as EOS Quattro Inc. Uh, I basically am just here uh, as support. I have extensive experience in uh, hours of operation. I've operated several restaurants in several towns and thought I'd make myself available if I could provide any insight from the business perspective. Uh, I overall have very little to add to, to what your discussion's been. Uh, the only thing I would say uh, from a proprietary standpoint is that I personally don't believe that uh, liquor licenses in this town need to operate till one o'clock in the morning. Uh, obviously licenses like that, which I've been involved with in the past, are in uh, areas more like Boston and Worcester, where your, where your traffic is foot driven and it's a much later culture. Uh, to Mr. Sestari's point, um, there is definitely a relationship in the suburbs to food service and liquor service, though I would caution that uh, there is definitely um, some trends that come and go in the course of the seasons, uh, case in point, uh, in the summer months uh, when it doesn't get dark until 9 o'clock. It is very possible to sit a party down for dinner at 10 and it could be uncomfortable to ask them to leave at 11.30, which is one of the numbers I've heard rolling around. Um, for a full you know, opportunity to sit down 
actually order a meal, have it prepared, served, have the full enjoyment of not being hurried. Uh, it's my personal experience that you could accommodate that any night of the week till midnight and not interfere with anybody's appropriate service at good time. So that's pretty much the nuts and the bolts of my position on it. If uh, anybody has any questions uh, for me being purveyor, I'd be happy to field them. Questions for this gentleman? So can I get a meal at 10.30 tonight at Quattro? Uh, probably not. <laughs> but I can bring it to your house at 10.35. No, I'm fine. <laughs> no, okay. I'm fine. Anybody questions? Okay, good. I'll catch you afterwards. Thank, Thank you. you. You good? Um, okay, good. All right, so I think, unless anyone else has any comments, Mr. Kamal, let's, uh, let's finalize this, and I think it's probably time to think about scheduling a public hearing, right? I think we're almost there. Yeah. Good. Looks good. Do you need anything more from us? No, just to assure the board that the new regulations that we will propose for the one-day one um, special licenses and the farm-related wines will not be drastically different from anything that the board has, oh, sure. uh, has discussed before. Okay. Again, I think we want to support the farm one in particular, so those, these should not be written, just like outdoor patios, these should not be written terribly onerous. Right? They should be protecting public safety, but not so, but we don't want to discourage it. We just want to be reasonable in our controls. Okay. So good, we're done with that one. Let's go to back to item seven, the agenda of the fiscal year 2015 second quarter financial update. The town CFO will present the financial update to the board. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. If I may suggest perhaps the board acts on uh, item four. Do, well, I can't sign them till after the meeting anyway. But the town clerk is... Oh, you're waiting patiently. I thought you had to be here anyway from when we signed it, but you don't. All right, so let's take action on item four. Sorry, I just assumed you had to be here. So let's take action on item four. The state presidential primary election warrant. It's an action item. The Board of Selectmen will consider sign the March 1st, 2016 state presidential primary election warrant as requested by the town clerk. And can we get the town clerk to come on up and tell us what you want us to do? Um, using the last state presidential primary four years ago as an example, I created the warrant for this year's presidential primary. Um, they need to be signed before your next meeting. That's why I had to schedule it for this meeting because of the Mass General Law requirements for posting of the warrants. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. McCann? Mr. Herr. Nope. Mr. Mosier, nope. Mr. Catino, Mrs. Sistari. Seeing no questions, I think we're all set. Chair, I entertain a motion that the board sign the uh, warrants for the March 1, 2016 state presidential primary election. So moved. Second. For the discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present not voting. That's unanimous. Okay. So we can, so I'm sorry to keep you here, but we can sign them after the meeting, though, is okay? You can sign them after the meeting. Okay, good. Thank you again. Sorry to make you wait. No, not a problem. All right. Mr. Kamal is having a sidebar. All right, while we do that, we'll go to consent agenda. So two items of consent agenda tonight. Minutes. The board will consider accepting the following public session minutes. Mr. Kamal, are we good on accepting the minutes? Yes, please. Yes. yes. Ten, October 5th, October 20th, November 3rd, November 17th, December 1st, December 15th, January 5th, and January 19th, 2016, and then gifts and action item. The board will consider accepting a gift to the Hopkinton Fire Department Ambulance Fund in the amount of $155 from WCH classmates in memory of Constant, Constance Marcadont. Would you like to break any items out? Okay, Chair, I a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion, motion to approve. Second. Uh, for the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, President, the voting, that's unanimous. So we accept the consent agenda for to nothing. Um, our thanks to, um, to the classmates at WCH and, uh, and our, our uh, deep condolences to the family of Constance Marconant. All right, Mr. Kamalo, we are now back to item uh, seven on the agenda, the second quarter financial update. Are we good for that now? Or do you want me to keep on going? 
Yeah, let's keep on going. Let's get keep liaison on. reports and board invitations and events tonight. So, Ms. Kamal, I'll start this off. Did the board get any invitations this in the last two weeks? No invitations. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Herr, any liaison reports? Uh, nothing to report. Uh, after our last meeting, I did have some outreach from a couple of organizations and responded to some things, so all good. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mosier. No, Mr. Herr, uh, Mr. Blakos. Um, so. In the future, Chairman. Mr. Catino. Well, the CPA still hasn't met, but the uh, planning board uh, met and uh, I presented the uh, uh, Zach's uh, proposals, uh, some of them for the uh, Tom Warrant, and they, they were. Um, they, they were taken quite well. Okay, good. Mrs. Sistar, any liaison reports? Uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, we had another <coughs> review committee uh, meeting, and uh, continuing to move along on that. But I think it's been generally acknowledged that uh, having anything set up for the May uh, town meeting is unrealistic at this point. There's no way we can get this on the special, even under a special time meeting warrant. I mean, it would be so much better to get this done in May. Um, it, one, one of the primary reasons is because even after we come up with uh, suggested changes, they need to be sent over to the Attorney General's office for review. Mm. And that review, uh, we're told uh, we need to leave uh, four or five weeks for them to review. So that really means it backs things out and says things need to be finished by the last week in March. Uh, and even then, we don't necessarily have a confidence rate <coughs> that everything will be accepted by the AG. Okay. So just no way to pull it off. All right. So that will not happen. Okay. Anything else? Good. Uh, on to the second quarter financial update. You ready to roll? Gentlemen, Let's go. yes, Good I evening. am. Welcome. Uh, this is your first big presentation to us, if I'm not mistaken. Were you, are you characterizing this as big? <laughs> <laughs> I just got a little bit more nervous. <laughs> uh, this is the I, most important update of the year. <laughs> no, I'm just I apologize. Um, I'm going to have to go switch the slides manually. I, uh, was, uh, I did not do it in uh, PowerPoint, but I will next time for you folks. Um, this is this, this, right? This, this is the printout we have? Yes. yes. You should have uh, five pages to go inside with the five slides. Um, I thought since uh, the governor last week came out with his preliminary budget proposal uh, that um, it would be a good time to go over uh, state revenues uh, and uh, state assessments in the history in Hopkinton over the past several years. Um, sometimes you never get that big picture because you go year by year. So I, what I have down here is the, the three major classifications of state receipts that the town receives. And these are under the category of unrestricted general government. For this discussion, we'll exclude other items such as grants, Chapter 90, those types of uh, revenues. Um, this is only unrestricted. They can be used. They go into the general fund and they can be uh, um, voted, uh, appropriated on a town meeting for any lawful purpose. Um, the, the biggest by far, as you can see, is the Chapter 70 revenues. Thank you. Is the Chapter 70 revenues. And uh, down below that, you'll see another handy little graph that will show you the increase from year to year, or decrease as the case may be, because in some cases they have decreased. Um, if you'll notice, uh, if you go drop down to that second chart where it's got the percentages of the increases, you'll notice for the past maybe four or five years, it's always running around uh, a percent and a half increase from year to year. Some of them go up <clears throat> within that and some of them go down. Uh, chapter 70, which is by far the largest, is your ed educational funding. Uh, the unrestricted general government aid is lottery funds uh, that are given to the um, town. <coughs> And state-owned land is what they're compensating us for, for land 
that they are uh, that they <coughs> occupy and they own, uh, um, but we receive no uh, revenues from in the form of real estate taxes. And I would imagine it might have something to do with. Uh, a reservoir, maybe, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure of your particular circumstances yet. But there's that number. That number they have, it was supposed to be to a formula, but every year it seems like that number becomes a political football and goes up and down depending on which, bo which government body is proposing the budget. So you can see the delta over the last uh, um, seven years, it's actually eight years, but seven years of change has been about a 7% increase, which, is, which uh, um, averages out to you know, about uh, a percent a year. Uh, if you drop down below, you'll see your uh, state assessments. Um, the, well, you'll see your assessments. One of the, one of the components is the state assessments. Uh, that's uh, items like mosquito control, um, that um, MAPC or uh, those types of agencies that charge us an assessment every year to, in order to perform some work that benefits Hoppington. The transportation number is a reimbursement of uh, transportation <coughs> monies um, for folks that are bused outside of the town, I believe. And tuition, charter, and uh, school choice, those are your, um, your charges for students that reside in Hopkinton but go outside of the town. Uh, that's an interesting one, as you can see, that number, if you look down to the bottom of the chart under the percentages, increases, and decreasing, that one seems to fluctuate wildly to the point where I might ask where are they getting their numbers from for the amount of students. As you can see, the first, over the, five, over the seven years, it's been about a 15% increase. Um, but it goes down, then it goes up 6%, then it goes down a percent, then it goes up 3%, goes up another 3%. Oh, excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong one. It goes, uh, you know, it's, it, it's gone down. Actually, it's gone, this, this particular figure, it's kind of interesting because you never usually see the, uh, the amount of students that actually leave the district to get educated go down, and this one has over the seven-year period to the point where uh, the last, in the governor's budget, he's, re he's proposing a 7.5% decrease. So the takeaway from all this is that basically the money we've gotten from the state for the last six years has been flat, more or less. And a little bit of fluctuation, but basically flat. Correct. Okay. Correct. Why don't we just go off to the, huh? Yeah, it's just totally, right, it's just good. I mean, again, I don't know if you need to belabor this unless there's something, something critical you want to talk oh, about. No, no, I, um, to does anybody next. have any questions on the, on the assessments or state aid nope. presentation? Why don't, we go to the, why don't we just talk quickly about the receipts and then, and then run through the, um, the kind of year-to-date summary of, of uh, sure. the revenues. And just, you know, again, you can hit the high points. The, the next two slides are just repeating what Charts. I've already said. Yep. And they're showing that, you, as you stated, uh, they're uh, pretty much flat lines going up about a percent a year. And if you averaged out the assessments, they're, uh, they're, they've gone up a little, but then they've pretty much stabilized at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you want to skip right to the revenues? Yeah, why don't you just, yeah, I mean, again, I think the, the key questions here are, are we tracking on what we expect to track on? I mean, clearly the motor vehicle excise is, is just a wacky outlier, so I'd like to understand that one. Uh, yeah, and every one of those can be explained. It's timing difference. They're billed in January and February of the year, so the only thing that we picked up to this point is the stragglers from mm -hmm. previous years. So is there anything in this that concerns you that's, odd, that's wildly off track? No, actually, actually I was very comforted when I completed this because uh, a, lot of, 
A lot of things seem to be tracking just where you thought they would. Even, even the water and sewer charges, which appear low for six months, mm -hmm. it's one of the buildings didn't get, it didn't get in until December 3rd, meaning that it wasn't due until January. And of course, uh, na pe people's nature being to wait till the last minute, uh, um, some of that revenue was not, uh, you know, captured. Um, I, I did also note, and I talked about to Norman about this earlier, that I'm amazed at the amount of state and federal grants that the, the town uh, brings in. It's very impressive, and so I thought I'd throw that in there, too, just as a general point of interest. Question from Mr. Catino. No, no, I just was glad to Oh, you're good with that. Okay. Yes. Mr. Sestar, any questions? Mr. Hur, any questions? My only question is that we're through 1231.16 on the revenues. Um, the target. Oh, so you meant 15. So yeah. uh, I'm sorry, through 15. Um, the target, so basically six months into the fiscal year, correct? The, no, the target is for, the target is right off of our approved budget by the Department of Revenue. For the full year. That's correct. Right. So then the percent is, in general, other than a couple of categories, it's below the 50% number that I would expect sort of across the board halfway through the year. You see what I'm saying? Yes, and every one of those can be explained through uh, timing, et cetera. Do any of these concern you? No, they don't. Okay, I'm good. Good morning. Good. Just thank you, Mr. Kamala, for all the hard work getting some grant money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good numbers. Anything else we should know about any of this? Any, any financial issues no, you want to raise? Any house things in the finance department generally? Tell me what you're doing. Oh, uh, great. I'm yeah. glad to talk about it for a second. Um, actually, the department's doing really well. Um, as you know, Maureen uh, retired in December, and uh, Diane's been filling in admirably in her place. And as you're aware uh, from your votes, uh, we'll be uh, borrowing about approximately $9 million for recently approved projects uh, um, mm -hmm. that at the, at, uh, the fall town meeting. Yep. Um, also, we just completed our first water and sewer billing in Munis. Um, I've I've been through uh, transitions before between systems, and utility billing is by far the hardest I've ever seen, and we seem to have done an admirable job. It took a lot of work, a lot of checking, rechecking, dual billing on two different systems, but despite uh, being down a few people, um, everybody in my department is uh, probably, other than two people, is uh, less than a year. Um, and considering that, uh, I think we're doing a great job at, uh, at not only keeping up with our daily duties, but doing stuff like converting the billing over to the new billing. So. And how's the repopulation ever going, Don? I'm sorry? How's the, how's the re repopulating the finance department going? How's, how's the searches coming along? Well, we did uh, have a setback. We interviewed applicants for a treasurer um, we had one candidate if that sounds familiar and, uh, and uh, so, so no we don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> and so we we've uh, we've actually gone Can't back out to, okay to, okay good to, only that, that's just a sheer brilliance to do that when that happens good for you. Okay. <laughs> thank you <laughs> All right. Anything else we should know about the department? How how the money's flowing? Any any concerns? Any budget season? Your budget making season. Process? We're we're a Progress. little behind. I came in towards uh, um, what normally would be the middle of the process for me. Right. I don't like working to where my product isn't up to my expectations, and I just unfortunately have been uh, forced to uh, just get it to the point where you know, we can move forward with it. But next year, I look forward to making a whole bunch of changes so that it goes a lot more smoother. Good. Does anybody have questions for Chris? Anybody else? No questions for, for Chris. I guess, um, you know, Chris, this is only because this is your first budget season that you're going through, and, you know, I, and I hear your pain. And the question for Mr. Kamala is, uh, do you still have access to our, our consultant? Did you 
a consultant. Um, Chris and I have a, have, a, have a phrase that we commonly share when we meet. We don't want to mention the name, the word consultant in our conversations. Uh, we do, but I think at this point we feel comfortable with that. Uh, we, we, can, we can get through without uh, relying on any additional consultants. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Nice, nice to see you. Thank all. you. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, back to item six on the agenda Hopkins Sustainable Green Committee charge a discussion. The board will discuss revising the charge for the Hopkins Sustainable Green Committee. Mr. Kamal, you want to start this one off? Yes. Um, this is a request that came in through uh, Mr. Moja, and as I mentioned to our board members uh, individually, um, we have we have tried several times to revise the, the membership and composition of the Hopington Sustainable Green uh, Committee in the past. I think the last effort was uh, productive where the membership remained at um, 16, uh, though we simply required that uh, seven be permanent and the rest be associates. I, I have had several conversations with uh, some of the active members of the committee. And <coughs> Here's the suggestion that I'm hearing, a very interesting concept, namely that over the past three, four years, the town has done a good job through the facilities department to identify energy savings related projects. Uh, and as part of that process, they have also built a portfolio of projects that can keep Dave and the committee engaged and busy for the next three to four years. And thus, the key question to me is, what is the best way of tapping into the committee's members' experience, uh, commitment, uh, so that at least we can enhance their value add to the process? Uh, they are very comfortable with the list of projects that are identified uh, for the next three to four years. They believe that they can offer the best of their um, expertise and experience um, if they are working directly with Dev Del Torrio uh, by way of um, focusing specifically on providing additional technical resources. In other words, they believe they can be of more benefit and more value to the community if they simply provide technical advice uh, to the facilities department. And so therefore, this may require us to revise the charge for the committee substantially. Uh, they also uh, have suggested to me that um, 16 members of the committee uh, has turned out to be very difficult to manage. Uh, and thus, they would like us again to uh, focus on trimming down the numbers the, 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 the numbers of, of the number of members uh, on the committee, uh, as well as uh, refocusing their efforts. Again, the idea here being value add. What is it that they can do best for the community? And they believe providing technical assistance on projects that they've discussed um, is a better use of their time versus coming to general meetings for general discussions. Okay, Mr. Moji, this has been your your baby for a while, so Mar yeah. Mar so. Um 16 members, I think, has been really. Mr. Kamala, do you know the last time they met with a quorum? Which would be um, nine, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's been difficult to accomplish a quorum. I don't have the exact date okay. when they were last able to. I believe it's been a while. Um, so I would like to trim this down substantially um, and not necessarily with the focus of. Uh, just the two individuals we spoke about. I don't know if we need, if they need any sort of official capacity to uh, to work with um, the town engineer. But uh, for the green committee, I was I was going to trim it down to maybe three, maybe five members total. Three with two associates. You get a get a quorum with three members, hmm. or with two members rather. Yes, um, a couple of points, though, in relation, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes. One being, um, as, as, as was recently noted in, uh, in Chris's presentation, the town has done a good job uh, through the efforts of the volunteers as well as staff in accessing grants. I think having some form of committee in place 
that allows the individuals to work in an official capacity uh, is advantageous when we apply for, for grants. Um, and with that in mind, I, I, I think it, it, it may still be necessary to have uh, the members of the committee act in some official capacity. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the, the members that uh, the board could consider, uh, I think three to five would be a manageable number. Uh, I also think having two parallel processes may be confusing. I think what I'm hearing is there's a, there's a good menu of projects that have been identified through this wide com uh, co committee process, and now is the time to really focus on a few priority projects and get things done on the ground. It's, it, it essentially sounds like it's like work off the backlog, basically. Shrink the committee down now and just have those folks work on uh, implementing what we've already agreed to. Is that sort of what the... Correct. I think at the time, at the time this, was, this charter was done, there was all kinds of community enthusiasm. It was new, right. going for the green communities. There was a lot <coughs> of need for, for outreach and, and um, just a lot of grunt work, a lot of heavy lifting around paperwork and things like that. That's been distilled down now. The, the town's made a lot of progress, and the projects that we have now are, are much more focused and technical, I think. Yeah. So are you good with this concept? I am. I just don't think there's a need for a committee this size anymore. I think it, it hinders uh, the actions of the committee. I think a, a great number would be uh, three voting members with two associates. You can get a quorum with two people. Mr. Terry, got any comments on this? It just sounds like a small committee for the community, but if it's not uh, needed as much as it had been in the past, then I guess I'm okay with it. I like five, but if it's three and two associates, I'm okay. We does seem a little small, you know, yeah. for a group that make. That's my only comment, but I'm flexible. Okay. Mr. Sistari? Um, I like five, and if you want to go two associates, and you know, is, is it necessary that there be a representative from the board of selectmen on the planning board, too? If it says in here. Are you saying five plus two is seven, or three plus two is five? I'm saying, I'm saying five. They want to have two associates, two associates. I agree. I think five, excuse me, I think three is small. I think five permanent plus five two. members, two associates, if you feel that there's any associates necessary. And then, I don't know. So, so through the chair, so five members total, two of them are associates. No, five, five, five members, members, full members with and two associates. Any associates that would be two. Okay, for a total of if seven. Yeah. Do we think there need to be associates? Is there enough interest? Well, and what do associates add? I mean, is the other question, right? What do they What do they bring? What do associates add? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, if there's a lot of interest, I, I don't. All and they're kind of in the mm -hmm. you know, warming a seat when there's when there's the flexibility. Mm -hmm. But if they're at 16 and have a difficult time getting eight for a quorum, then the question can be asked. You know, do you even need associates? Yeah. So, so through the chair, I think we in this case we probably don't. I haven't been to a meeting in a long time. I haven't been asked to be to a meeting in a long time. <clears throat> the last contact I had was was that there was they were having difficulty making a quorum. And uh, I followed through discussions with Mr. Kamalo. Um, he, he expressed uh, a, a necessity, a function for them to fulfill within town hall around some of these other projects. Um, so we're just trying to facilitate a way to pair that, pair that committee down, uh, so it can be productive again. In fact, I'm not really attached to a number three versus five. The only other thing I'd like to add is in the committee charge. You know, I don't know if this has to be written or not, but we're making it clear that um, you know, we're there. You know, it's just providing leadership and practical solutions, but it's doing it in an advisory role to to the town. Dave still has the same decision-making authority that he has today. Yeah, I don't think I would change anything <coughs> within what the actual functions of the committee would be. 
I think. You just, just want to shrink it. Yeah, just shrink it. Like this charter is pretty off. Please. Ms. Catino, you want to get anything? Yeah, I, I know what it's like going from a committee of nine up to 15. So you get to get it to get a quorum. I do not have much in the yeah. But I just think going from going from four to was it 14 to 16. Uh, uh, yeah, 16 to 3 would be drastic, so I, I would actually be happy with a 7, but if you can't even get the 7, you get anything done. What, what has what has been a number? Do you know? And does anybody know? Well, if less you can't eight. get a quorum, does that, you can't get a quorum because only three people showed up or because there was only six or seven showing up? I can tell you at this point, there are only two members who are participating actively and have been meeting with Dave informally uh, on a monthly basis just to give just to give the board the flavor of the the scope of projects that they are considering these are very technical projects um led street lights electric charging stations peak demand analysis what they're trying to do is to come up with a system that will benefit the wider community by addressing the the the, the fact that nstar eversource now raises rates during mm -hmm. peak demand seasons. They want to come up with a policy that will at least help town residents on that issue. And then they also want to address, it, it pick up a couple projects that are long-term focused on energy savings and sustainability. So this is basically, this is, become, this is, like, the, this is like the PBC. We need, we need technical people who really want to dive deep on these things and think about it. What the, the PBC has, well, setting aside the project members, five core folks, right? Or is it seven? No, it's five. It's five. And, yeah. and we came to five because there were also considerations that the town needed to have individuals with financial expertise. Right. We don't need that in this regard because we have Dave working with the CFO on financial issues. But again, I think there's a concern that five's too, three is too few. I think the board circle, I think what I'm hearing is the board circling around five. You ready for a motion? Please. Well, do we, I don't know if we even need a motion, but we can just give direction, but if you want to make one, I guess. But go ahead, Ms. Kamal, finish. Again, um, what, I'm, what I took from my discussions with the two active members is that they really want to roll up their sleeves and work. They don't want to run into the challenges that they've run into in terms of organizing the bureaucracy that comes along with trying to get meetings, trying to get quorums and so forth. But the thing is, if you, need, if you got five, though, you need three for a quorum, right, which is, which is sort of what you're looking for. If you, if you do three, you need two for a quorum, which is starting to get kind of small, right, and concentrated. So, I mean, I don't know why, I don't know why five doesn't work. It's still a public process that requires community input, and sometimes it's hard to get that input to their point and their concern, but I think we have to protect that right. uh, democratic you process. Mean, you think in five? So I would move that we set the uh, Sustainable Green Committee uh, membership level to five individuals. Okay, we have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President voting that's unanimous. So it's five members. And then should we just ask Mr. Kamala to go off and revise the charge to reflect the sort of technical, more technically based nature of the group? Yes, sir. Do we need to discuss the terms? Because in here it starts talking about X number of three years, yeah. X number well, that was just how to fill the seats, and I was thinking we could have Mr. Kamala do that as part of a sort of gen more broader rewrite of the charge to reflect some of what he talked about. Is that okay with you? So we need to find at least one more interested citizen that can help, and then we have that quorum, and then they can do the things they want to do. Go off and get going. Right. John, make a, make a pitch. Okay. They have great ideas, by the way. I'm fully in support so of Mr. Kamala, you can go off and fill in the rest? Okay. <laughs> so if anybody's interested, contact Mr. Kamala. Town Manager's Report, Mr. Kamalo. Yes, um, I included in your packet the, an update on the work we're doing on the Main Street Corridor project. Uh, I also did provide to the board um, the information that Mr. Hay had requested uh, on the eminent domain steps. Uh, the update I included in your packet simply boils down to we need to have a very serious conversation with Eversource uh, to allow the undergrounding project to, to proceed. Uh, Eversource has raised two uh, comments that we're all struggling uh, mm. to, to understand. Uh, of, um, the two comments relate to one, 
the town having to adopt a law that then allows Eversource to uh, charge rate payers uh, extra for the project. We've, we've told them we don't want to go in that direction. The town will fund this project. We're not on, on rate payers to do that. So we are asking them to justify to us why they want the town to adopt that, 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 that by, by law. Uh, the second issue is in relation to Eversource coming up with a, uh, with, with a claim that uh, the town is entitled to pay them 25.6% 25 25 of the cost of the project. And we, we think that is tied to another comment that they've made, namely that they want to take over the non-electric utilities that are part of this project. We don't understand why. Yeah, good luck so that. we're working towards scheduling a meeting where we will uh, bring in our consultants, uh, bring in town council, uh, and we also have a plan in place, uh, second level, which will uh, involve our legislative team should we not make any progress on this issue. Um, the message is clear from the town that we want them to move expeditiously with the design. We want to understand exactly what the costs are. And uh, these couple issues that they have raised are of concern not just to the town, but also to Mass DOT. Remember, Mass DOT is paying 50% of the project. And they came up with a fascinating plan that will allow us to at least use part of the TIF funding to offset the cost of the undergrounding. And that component is now at risk because um, Master OT is not willing to contribute to the 25.6% charge. Okay. Any questions from the board, Mr. Catino? No. Mr. Sestari. Mr. Harr. It may be too late for this in the evening, but why are we not thinking about having the utilities charge the ratepayers to do this work, town-wide? We have some big consumers that could help us a lot that it wouldn't be a big hit to them, but it would certainly be a big hit to the average taxpayer because if the town pays for it, it's a taxpayer hit. Same, go ahead, Mr. Kamal. Yeah, if I may, uh, Ms. Sihe, the, the, the town has come up with perhaps a two-part two funding plan where we are relying on mitigation to fund the bulk of the project uh, together with the grant money from the state, and we're anticipating that the, the remainder of, of, of the project costs would be um, now a manageable number, especially considering the fact that we've downsized the scope of the project. And if we go the utility route for that funding, it takes that away? I guess it is the same either way. I don't want to complicate matters. But if we've got so okay, if we've got some grants coming our way, and that Mass DOT is willing to pay for some of this undergrounding, and then the taxpayer, who, ratepayer, whatever you want to call them, okay, I'm good. Okay. Mr. Moore, Thanks. Questions? No. Good. Thank you, Ms. Kamal. Good update. Okay. Fiscal year 17. Anything? Uh, simple updates is we received the uh, school budget <coughs> request. We're crunching the numbers. Uh, well, hoping to have at least a good sense of where this budget stands by the end of next week. Okay. Yeah. Now, for your board agenda items, Mr. Kamal and I have been going through the rail to um, to try to pick up things that are of, of interest to members, and so we're, we've been adding them on the agendas. But any new things, Mr. Mojo? Were we going to talk at some point about the um, former Colella's parking lot and sort of how that plays into the intersection, the library? Yes, we're working on getting the planning done for that. Remember, we set the town engineer off and asked yep. him to sort of plan the, the real fix mm -hmm. and then come back and talk to us about it. So that's just awaiting him being able to get that work done. Okay. But that is absolutely high up Great. on the priority list. Thank you. Mr. Herr. Not at this time. Mr. Cont uh, Catino. Nothing at this time. This is a story. Uh, last time I mentioned having the director of IT on, I just like to make sure you do that around the budget. Next, um, next meeting is on the agenda. Okay. Um, two final things for me. First of all, um, library groundbreaking has now been tentatively scheduled March 11th, I think, Mr. Kamala. Yeah, Ms. Kamala. So we're going to have a big uh, groundbreaking for the library. It's planned to be on March 11th. You'll be seeing more details about it soon, but mark your calendars. It should be um, a fun event. And then the second thing is, and I glossed over it earlier tonight because we had a lot going on and we were running late and we had to get to the, to the beaver issues, but I do want to say, Ms. Kamala, uh, uh, we're very excited to have you having 
c committed to another contract here with the town. It's been a great having you here for seven years. We're looking forward to having you here for a lot longer. So, um, so I'm glad we got that all resolved tonight, and and, uh, and thank you for your your wonderful service for all these years. So I want to make sure I didn't let that go by. And with that, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion second for discussion. No. All in favor, say aye. 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 President voting. That's it. Good night, everyone.